Chapter Thirty of the Petticoat Commando by Johanna Brandt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Forming a new committee. Not until it became positively known at Harmony, towards the middle of October, that the members of the secret committee had been sent away to Bermuda, did Mrs. Van Warmelo and Hansie breathe freely again. The suspense of five full weeks was over at last a suspense not to be described, and never to be forgotten by those who endured it. It did not seem possible to grasp the fact that those brave men had escaped with their lives, and Hansie, looking up at the stars that night, felt that she had learnt something of unspeakable value in the relief and gratitude with which that period of concentrated suffering had been followed. Carlo looked up at the stars, too, for he invariably followed his young mistress's gaze. But on this occasion, seeing nothing unusual in that vast expanse, he stood up on his hind legs before her and gave a short bark of inquiry. "'They have gone, Carlo,' she said. "'I know you won't believe it, but they have really gone. And if Gentleman Jim knew anything about this, he would surely say, "'I suppose their time hadn't come yet, little missy.' That's it, Carlo. Their time had not come yet. But they have left things in a fearful muddle, and we will have to work as we never worked before. The first thing to be done tomorrow morning will be... She stopped suddenly. Not even to her faithful Carlo could she confide the secret plan which she had made for reorganizing and reestablishing on a safer footing the secret service of the Boers in town. She would form a new committee of five women this time, who would carry on the work on the same lines which had been adopted by the secret committee, and this plan, when she unfolded it to her mother that night, was received with warm approval. The first and last meeting was held at Harmony on October 15th, and was attended by Mrs. Malin, Mrs. Armstrong, Mrs. Honey, Mrs. Von Warmelow, and Hansie, who was appointed secretary. Bound together by the sacred oath of fidelity and secrecy, these five women vowed to serve their country and people as an organized body of workers as long as they had the power to do so. On the occasion of his next visit to the capital, Captain Naughty was to be informed of the formation of the new committee, but for the rest its very existence was to be kept a dead secret. Mrs. Van Warmelo told the members that she was in a position to communicate with the President in Holland by every mail, and that the methods employed by her would be revealed to them after the war. With this they expressed themselves satisfied, willingly leaving the matter of sending away dispatches from the field in Mrs. Van Warmelo's capable hands. It was felt that the greatest responsibility resting on them at the time was to have a suitable place of refuge ready to receive the captain when he next entered the town. There was no house free from suspicion since the arrest of the committee, except, except Harmony. Harmony, surrounded as it was by British officers and their staffs, by British troops and military mounted police. Harmony was at last chosen as the most suitable, the only spot in Pretoria in which the captain of the Secret Service could be harbored with any degree of safety. It was arranged that he would immediately be brought to Harmony when he came again, and in the meantime the committee would be on the lookout for an opportunity to send a warning and instructions out to him not to approach the houses hitherto frequented by him. For many weeks no spies belonging to his set came into town. No war news of any description reached his friends, except one day the information conveyed, we know not how, of the safe arrival at the scurvy bergen of young Els, the spy who had been fired upon and was missing from his companions on that eventful September 12th, that this news gave his relatives and friends great joy and relief. After the intense anxiety gone through on his account, my readers will readily understand. The discovery of the white envelope was not always a source of unmixed satisfaction. 
one of them containing news of the betrayal and arrest of the committee, and sent to Alphen in the ordinary way, failed to reach its destination. This caused the senders so much anxiety that for some time they did not dare risk the sending of another. The letter might have fallen into the hands of the censors, and the secret be discovered by them, in which event they were probably waiting quietly to catch up further information. It may have only been a coincidence, but at this time the plotters at Harmony observed that the censorship on their post had been withdrawn altogether. They knew only too well what this meant, and their hearts sank when they thought of the white envelope. It meant, good reader, that there was a most disquieting increase in the vigilance of the censor. It meant that their letters were opened by steam to throw them off their guard and to encourage them to write with greater frankness to their absent friends. Mother and daughter felt the hair rising on their heads when they thought of one of their precious white envelopes being subjected to a treatment of steam by the censors and of his exaltation on beholding the result. As days went by, their dread of him and his evil machinations increased, for hardly a letter reached them that did not betray the traces of his handiwork, or unhandiwork, for he was not always judicious in the quantity of glue used by him in reclosing the envelopes. He should have been a little more economical in the use of government property if he really wished to hoodwink his enemies, and he would have saved Mrs. Van Warmelo the trouble of dampening the envelopes afterwards where they stuck on the inside to the letters. While the steaming process was being carried on at the general post office, no white envelopes were taken to the censor, but they were posted at Johannesburg by friends. And in this way, the distant correspondents were warned of danger, until it became evident that the steam censorship had been withdrawn, and the old, reassuring order of things been established once more. A week or two later, another white envelope from Holland reached Harmony, in safety, by which it was known that the secret was still undiscovered. But the fate of the missing envelope remained a mystery to the end, and was a constant reminder and warning to the conspirators to be careful in the use of their priceless secret. I am sure the post office officials had plenty to do during the war, but there is no doubt that their labors were considerably lightened by the smugglers, who chose to dispense with the services of the censors entirely. And then we must not forget the activities of the spies and other fellow workers in town. Quite a large private postal service was carried on by them, as we all know, and every week, before the entry into Pretoria became so difficult and dangerous, hundreds of letters were carried backwards and forwards to and from the commandos. One man in town was in the habit of receiving great batches of these smuggled letters, which he distributed to the various addresses, until one day he was very nearly caught. He had just received a packet of communications from the front, and had it opened on his writing table in his quiet study, when the doors were opened unceremoniously, and some officials entered with a warrant to search his house. Carpets were taken up, walls were tapped, furniture was overturned and examined, Books were removed from their shelves, and every cranny inspected with the greatest thoroughness. But the pile of letters, lying open on his writing table, over which they found him bending when they entered the room, was passed over without so much as a glance. This may sound a bit unreal, unlikely, but there are similar cases on record, which we know to be true beyond a doubt, and one of these I must relate because it so closely concerned our friends at Harmony, and so very nearly proved to be their undoing. They did not know it at the time, but were told by Mrs. Cloete after the war that she had sent all their uncensored, their smuggled letters, to her friend at Cape Town, Mrs. Koopmans de Witt, with instructions to read and return them to her as soon as possible, which Miss Koopmans had done with alarming news that her house had been thoroughly searched for documents while the pile of letters was lying open on her writing table. The authorities must have been struck blind, she had said, 
for though they had overhauled the place and taken away with them every suspicious-looking document, they had passed and repassed the papers on her table without a word, with nothing more than a superficial glance. This information had alarmed Mrs. Cloete so much that she had immediately packed every incriminating letter and all her white envelopes into a tin, which she secretly buried with the help of her German nurse under one of the trees at Alphen. And there they, or what is left of them after ten years, still lie, for the spot has never again been found, although every effort was made to do so. End of chapter 30《Chapter Thirty One of the Petticoat Commando》by Johanna Brandt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. T for Two. It was at the time when the Northern Territories were being swept by the enemy for the first time that Mrs. Van Warmelo heard that a relative of hers had been put over the border and was staying with her husband at the Grand Hotel in Pretoria. She therefore asked Hansie to call at the hotel to inquire whether she could be of any assistance to them in their trouble, and Hansie donned her prettiest frock that very afternoon on her calling expedition, Carlo walking with unusual sedateness by her side. "'We'll go and see General Maxwell, too, this afternoon, Carlo,' she said, "'and see whether we can get that permit. Always put on your best clothes.' when you go to the military governor, my boy. You'll find that Tommy Atkins never keeps you waiting then. Arrived at the hotel, she suddenly remembered that she had forgotten her young relative's name and did not know whom to ask for. She was waited upon by a hall porter who watched her with a face of stolid patience while she searched her memory for the forgotten name. At last she said, the lady I want was a Miss Marr, but she has married an Englishman since I last saw her. I have forgotten his name. Can you tell me whether there is a young couple with a baby from Zutzpanberg staying at the hotel? I'll find out, miss. He came back with the information that there were four young couples from Zutzpanberg, each with a baby. Hansie wondered that he did not smile. "'Are they all in?' she asked. "'Some are in, and some are out,' he said. Suddenly he seemed to wake up. "'Would it be any help if I told you their names?' he inquired. "'Yes, indeed,' she exclaimed. "'I would know the name at once if I heard it.' He brought her the book in which the names of visitors were entered, and read one name after the other slowly. "'That's it,' Hansie said. "'Nevitt. Is Mrs. Nevitt in?' "'No, miss, she is out, and I happen to know that she is leaving again soon. "'They only arrived yesterday. "'They were put over the border by the Boers.' "'I don't understand,' Hansie answered. "'Don't you see, miss, the Boers are still in possession of Petersburg, "'and Mr. Nevitt, as a British subject, has been put over the border.' "'Oh, yes, I see. "'Well, will you please give these cards to Mrs. Nevitt when she comes in?' Once on the street, Hansie again addressed herself to her faithful companion. It is not hard to believe that the world is turning round, Carlo, when one has to believe that Pretoria is the other side of one's own border. I wonder what our next sensation is to be. She was soon to find out. The military governor was engaged, and she was shown into the office of an under-official a tall, fair man whose name she did not catch. She was politely asked to take a seat, and the nature of her business inquired into. The tall, fair man bent over some papers he had before him, and toyed with a gold pencil, while she stated her case as clearly and as concisely as she could. He asked her a few questions. With long pauses in between, and again bent over his papers, making pencil marks, and turning the pages over slowly. The silvery chime of a tiny clock told the hour of five. You, er, will have some tea? No, thank you. Surprised. A moment's silence. 
Then he pressed an electric bell at his right hand. An immaculate buttons instantly appeared. T for two, the officer commanded, without raising his head. Buttons disappeared to return in an incredibly short time, bearing aloft a well-appointed tete-tete. When he had withdrawn, the hospitable officer, of whom it could well be said that he had a teapot in his soul, poured out two cups of tea with an abstracted air, pushed one towards Hansy with his right hand, while he slowly stirred his own with his left. "'Have some tea,' he said persuasively. There was no answer, and he again bent over the work with which he was occupied. Hansie got up quietly and left the room, but she had not gone many yards in the long corridor before she became aware of hurried footsteps following. It was the tall officer, very straight now, who called out to her. "'Stop, stop a moment. Where are you going?' Without turning round, she replied, "'To General Maxwell. He never keeps me waiting.' and walked on rapidly. "'Don't go,' he implored. "'Come back to my office. I have your permits quite ready for you. I was busy with them all the time.' She turned round slowly and walked back with him to his office. "'Thank you very much,' she said, as she took the papers from his hand. He opened the door for her with exaggerated courtesy, and she went on her way, brimming over with delight. "'I missed two teas this afternoon.' but I got my permits and came off with flying colors, she confided to her dumb companion. Let us go home and tell mother all about it. Carlo mine. End of chapter 31"'Kidnapping Mauser the Kitten. "'One afternoon, when Mrs. Von Wormelow and Hansi were returning home, "'as they passed the house occupied by one of the biggest lords in the British Army, "'they saw an exquisite black kitten sitting on the steps leading from the street to the garden. "'Such a kitten! Coal-black she was, except for a snowy shirt-front and four dainty snow-white paws.' A delicate ribbon of pale blue satin was fastened in a bow round her neck, and she blinked at the passers-by in friendly consciousness of her superior beauty. "'Oh, you darling!' Hansie exclaimed. "'I wish you belonged to me.' "'She does,' Mrs. Van Wormelo answered, and stooping, she picked up the unresisting kitten and placed it in her daughter's arms. It was done in a moment, and was meant as a joke, but Hansie took the matter seriously and walked on, rapturously caressing her small trophy of war. "'Hansie, put that cat down,' Mrs. Van Wormelo said, looking anxiously up and down the street. "'No, indeed, mother. You gave her to me.' "'You know very well I did not mean you to keep her. I declined to have anything more to do with the matter.' She walked rapidly on, and Hansie followed in some uncertainty, but holding on to her newfound treasure as if her life depended upon it. Soon she caught up with her indignant parent and said in a conciliatory tone of voice, "'Surely, mother, you don't suppose I would steal a cat from anyone else. But Lord is trying to take my country. Why should I not take his cat?' Two wrongs never made one right,' her mother answered." but do as you please, you always do. Hansie kept that kitten, and, after Carlo, loved it better than any other pet, and even Mrs. Van Wormelo relented as she watched the playful creature hiding in the shadows and springing out at every passer-by. "'What are you going to call her?' she asked her daughter. "'Oh, I don't know. Perhaps I'll go and ask Lord what he called her.' She stopped observing her mother's frown, and then went on. We must think of a name, a nice appropriate war name. A few moments later the kitten crept into a corner, with a small mouse held firmly between her jaws. Oh, mother, look, she has caught a mouse already. She is going to be a splendid mouser. And, oh, now I have a name for her. 
We'll call her Mauser, mother dear. So be it. Mauser is her name, and hereafter she may be seen invariably in Hansi's company, a welcome addition to the small, harmonious family. Perched on Hansi's shoulder as she sat reading under the veranda, or purring round her as she lay under the trees, with Carlo watching by her side, Mauser was ever to be found where her young mistress was. And when the latter went to town, she and Carlo were invariably escorted to the gate by the faithful Mauser, who again welcomed them on their return. The kidnapping episode had taken place a few months after the British entry into Pretoria. A full year had gone by, and Mauser the kitten had developed into a beautiful, full-grown cat, and was the mother of five mischievous little ones, gray-striped and very wild, for whom she had made a home in a deep hollow in the trunk of one of the big weeping willows, the very tree under which Gentleman Jim had built his small kitchen of corrugated iron. It is a stormy night in November 1901, a month remembered by all for the violence and frequency of its storms. Hansie is bending over her diary, trying to make her entries between the crashes with which the house is shaken. Her mother is lying on a couch nearby. Her tired eyes are closed, but she is not asleep. Who could sleep in such a storm? Perhaps we may be allowed to look over the writer's shoulder. November 8th, Friday, 10 o'clock p.m. And this terrific storm has been raging for hours. It seems incredible. It was the same last night and the night before. As I write, the roar of thunder never breaks off, peal after peal, crash after crash, vivid, dazzling flashes of lightning, torrents of rain mixed with hail, and a howling wind. Such a night is never to be forgotten. One is thrilled and impressed by its magnificence, by its awful grandeur, and its majesty, and yet I think one would go mad if it continued for any length of time. I feel as if I am going mad with the thought of our thousands and thousands of women and tender little children exposed to all this fury. Where is the God of pity tonight? Surely not in our desolate land, not in our ruined homes, not in South Africa. The fourth storm within a few hours, each more violent than the last, is just approaching, and this one threatens to surpass the others in unabated fury. The Lord hath turned his face from us. The hand of the Lord is laid heavily upon us. His ear is death to our cries and supplications. I cannot write. My soul is crushed by the sorrow, suffering, and sin around me. I feel better now, but the struggle has been great. At the front, fierce blows have been struck lately. Our men are fighting as they never fought before. How the storm rages on. In my sheltered home, safe from the fury of the elements, I think I suffer more than the women under canvas for their sakes. The letter I have before me must be answered now. He asks me to bind myself to him definitely. I have decided to do so. It is a weighty step, and God knows. But I have long prayed for guidance, and it seems to me clear enough that we are destined for one another. So tonight, in this raging storm, with a heart filled with the desolation of land and people, the blackness of the present, the hopeless misery of the future, I am going to write the words which will bind me forever to L.E.B. Strange betrothal, strange sequel to a stormy life. But perhaps, perhaps the future holds something for me of calm and peace. With throbbing brow, she went out into the night to watch the storm from a sheltered corner under the veranda. Nothing fascinated her so much. Suddenly, a blinding flash, accompanied by a sound like the sharp cracking of a whip and instantly followed by a deafening roar of thunder, drove her to her mother's side. "'Are you all right, mother? That bolt felt very near. I thought it struck the house.' It was frightfully close, Mrs. Von Warmelow answered. Come and sit beside me here. I am quite sure one of our big trees has been struck. She was right, 
for walking through the demolished garden next morning, they came upon the spot where the bolt had fallen, and found one of the gigantic willow trees furrowed from top to bottom, with the outer bark scorched and curled up like paper, and the white bark showing underneath. Jim was breaking down his little kitchen with all the speed he could. "'What are you doing, Jim?' Hansy asked. "'Jim's shifting,' was the answer, soberly and sadly made. "'But the storm is over. All the danger is past. You can safely stay on now.' "'No fear, little missy. The big boss was very cross last night, and when him cross, he don't care what he do. Jim want to live a little longer.' Hansy laughed. "'I wonder where Mauser could have been with her kittens last night,' she exclaimed putting her hand into the deep hollow of the tree. The nest is empty. Do you know, Jim? No, little missy. I suppose Mauser's time has not come yet, he said, with a stolid philosophy. I suppose not. But alas, alas, Mauser's time was soon to come, for the soldiers setting a strong trap to catch a wild cat, which was nightly plundering them of their meat ration, caught Hansie's beloved Mauser instead, killing her instantly. No reproaches from her mother were added to her keen remorse as she bent over the motherless kittens, whispering, I will care for you, as she would have done, but, oh, remember this, that honesty is the best policy, and all is not fair in love and war. Tragedy was in the air. A beekeeper came to Harmony one morning, to help Mrs. Von Wormelow take out honey from the hives. And this disturbance, combined with the fact that the soldiers had unwisely set up a smithy near the beehives, under the row of blue gum trees dividing their camp from Harmony, enraged the bees so much with the noise and the smoke and heat of the smithy fires that they attacked man and beast in vicious fury. In a few moments all was confusion. The servants rushed about frantically in their endeavors to bring the fowls and calves under shelter in time. The two women took refuge in the house, closing the doors and windows, while they watched the consternation and disorder in the camp. Fortunately, there was only one horse in the smithy at the time, a beautiful chestnut mare belonging to the provost marshal, Major Poor. So Mrs. Von Wormelow was told afterwards. The soldiers seemed to lose their heads entirely. They ran away, not into their tents, but right away into the copies on the other side of the railway line. The beekeeper cut the halter with which the unfortunate horse was tethered to a post. Then he too took refuge. What followed was pitiful to behold and will never be forgotten by the women, helplessly and as is fascinated by the scene, watching from their windows. The infuriated bees, deprived of all other living things on which to wreak their vengeance, turned in their thousands on the helpless mare, which stood unmoved, as horses do, when lashed by hail or panic-stricken under flames. She made no attempt to save herself, but with bent head and ears laid flat, she stood still under the furious attack of countless bees. One or two of the men, wrapped up to the eyes in their coats and waistcoats of their comrades, cautiously approached the mare at their own great peril, and tried with all their strength to move her from the scene. In vain, as if rooted to the spot she stood, with her forefeet planted firmly on the ground, and they desisted in despair, once more fleeing to the hills. All day they sat upon the hillside, homeless, many of them hatless, until towards afternoon, when, the fury of the bees abating, they ventured to return to their tents. The next day, when the dead mayor had been removed for burial, a letter was brought to Mrs. Von Wormelow from the provost marshal, commanding the immediate removal of the beehives to some safer spot in the lower portion of Harmony. This was done by degrees, little by little every night, in order to accustom the bees to the change gradually, and there was never any repetition of the attack. Hansi, writing to her brother in his prison fort at Ahmednagar, 
that his bees had put a valuable English horse out of action forever, received in reply a postcard with a single comment, My brave bees. End of chapter 32「Chapter Thirty Three of the Petticoat Commando by Johanna Brandt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The First Spies at Harmony. As we have said, the Committee of Women had decided on Harmony as the only safe spot for harboring Captain Naughty on his next visit. It was still hemmed in by troops on every side, and as the weeks went by and the Van Warmelos became more convinced that their name had not been betrayed with those of the secret committee, they settled down with a sense of peaceful security and prepared themselves once more for the reception of their friends. Their wonderful escape was a topic of daily conversation, and they congratulated themselves over and over again with not even having been approached by the military and put on their best behavior. No promises had been given by them, and they felt free as the birds of the air to continue their work of outwitting the enemy, whenever occasion presented itself. But occasions were rare now. As far as we know, there was no longer a spot in the fencework around Pretoria through which a spy could enter unobserved, and no word or sign had been received from the brave captain for more than three months. By this they knew that he had been informed of the calamities which had befallen his friends in town. Still they doubted not that he would at least make an attempt to come in again. His friends remembered him once having said that his keen enjoyment of the perils he underwent was only enhanced by the obstacles which lay in his way, and when the English thought they had made it quite impossible for any man to cross their lines, it would be his greatest pleasure to prove how much mistaken they were. There was no vain boasting in the quiet and natural way in which he made these remarks, but they were remembered with a strong conviction that he would keep his word. But still it was realized that his greatest difficulty would not be so much his entrance into the town as his perplexity when once he found himself there. He would not know where to go. His friends had been banished, their houses were occupied by the enemy, and as yet he did not know of the existence of the new committee. Sending out word to him was impossible. No man could risk the unknown dangers of leaving the town under the present condition to warn him. No one would know where to find the Secret Service Corps in the field. His friends decided to possess their souls in patience, trusting in the capabilities of the wily captain and knowing full well that if anyone could find a way out or in, he would. He did not disappoint them, and they might have known that on this occasion everything he did would be exactly opposite to his former methods. It was to be a time of surprises for everyone. Hansi and her mother were just talking about the captain and regretting the appearance of the young moon, which meant under ordinary circumstances no spies in town, and wondering how much longer they would be able to endure their suspense, wondering, too, how they would communicate with the commander in future, and longing for reliable news from the field, when the unexpected happened. At break of day, December 17th, three travelers entered the town, travel-stained, torn, and weary. They walked boldly through the streets of Pretoria in the dim light of a summer's dawn, and what their destination was we shall see presently. The Van Warmelos were having supper that night at eight o'clock, when the door opened unceremoniously and Philippi's shock head was thrust in. "'There are two ladies looking for harmony,' he said. They are at the front gate and want to see you. Hansie immediately went out and met two girls, strangers to her, coming up the garden path. Good evening, she said. Do you wish to see my mother? Who are you? was a somewhat unexpected but perfectly natural question. I am Miss Van Warmelo. Do you want anyone here? Yes, one of them replied in a hurried and mysterious way. There are two men at your garden gate, 
and they want to see Mrs. Van Warmelo. "'Won't you ask them to come up to the house?' Hansie asked. "'You can't very well expect my mother to.' "'Oh, yes, she must,' the other broke in hurriedly. "'It is all right. She knows them. They will tell her themselves what they want.' "'Wait here a moment. I will call my mother.' Hansie had some trouble in persuading her mother to leave the house. "'I'm not going down to the gate to see any men,' she said. "'Let them come up to me.' "'They won't, mother. It is no use. There is something behind this. They are either our own spies or the English are setting a trap for us. Be on your guard, but come out into the garden.' Sorely against her will, Mrs. Van Warmelo hurried out of the house, where she gave the girls a cool and haughty reception, saying, "'I don't understand this. Will you be good enough to ask your friends to come up to my house if they wish to speak to me?' And with that, she turned back to the house alone. Girl number one said, "'I think I had better go and fetch them. They are waiting near the wire fence,' and walked rapidly down the path while Hansie followed slowly with girl number two, asking many questions, but getting none but the most unsatisfactory replies. When they reached the gate, girl number one had disappeared altogether, and there was no sign of the men. Hansie thought this very suspicious, and was about to turn to her companion with an impatient remark, when she suddenly said something about going to look for girl number one, and disappeared too leaving Hansie standing alone at the gate with her troubled reflections. Men and girls had now disappeared for good, it seemed, and after what seemed an endless time of waiting, she decided to go back to the house, when she was suddenly joined by her mother, now thoroughly alarmed. "'It must be a trap, dear mother,' she whispered. "'I can't make it out. And here is someone coming at last.' But then her heart stood still, for a tall English officer, with helmet on and armed to the teeth, advanced, saluting the two ladies in the pale light of the young moon. Naughty, he whispered, stretching out his hand to them. Captain Naughty in an English officer's uniform? Thank God, thank God! In a moment, all was happy confusion. The captain introduced his corporal, Venter, warmly took leave of girls number one and two, thanking them greatly for the services rendered by them that night, and then the four people sauntered up to the house, talking loudly as they passed the sergeant major's tin villa on the other side of the fence. The glimpse Hansie caught of the good man, calmly sitting inside, smoking his pipe and reading, little dreaming that his arch-enemies were within a stone's throw of his peaceful abode, added a delightful thrill to the sensations experienced by her that night. Very little was said once they got inside. The hostesses took in the condition of the starved and exhausted heroes at a glance, and busied themselves with preparation for a feast, while the men stretched themselves on the sofas in the dining room. When Mrs. Van Warmelo had lit the fire in the kitchen and set the kettle on to boil, Hansie opened the windows of the drawing room as wide as possible, lit the lamps and candles, and opening the piano, played some loud music for the edification of the sergeant major. "'I've made him understand that we have visitors,' she said, laughing, when she got back to the dining room. "'He will quite understand that all-pervading smell of coffee, even if he can't account for ham and eggs at this time of night. Homemade bread, butter, and preserves, rusks, cold plum pudding, and fruit completed the repast, and how the men tucked in, they were so bruised and worn out that they could hardly sit up straight to eat, and when they had each forced a square meal into a round stomach, they once more stretched themselves out on the sofa, supremely content with their pipes. Mother and daughter sat beside them talking until nearly midnight. "'Tell me,' Hansie began at the end, "'tell me where you disappeared to from our gate. I can't quite forgive you the nasty fright you gave us.' You might have come straight up to the house. Well, Naughty answered, I did not know whether you were still in town and alone at home, and we could not risk finding you with visitors. While we were at the gate, some of the military mounted police passed, and we thought it safer to go for a walk. Unfortunately, 
we walked right into their camp, and before we knew where we were, we were falling over their tent ropes, and in our hurry to escape from them, we found ourselves before the house of the military governor, where the sentinels on guard saluted me most respectfully. I can't tell you how glad we were to find you waiting for us when we came back to the gate. The diary shrinks from the attempt to describe the thrilling adventures these men had to relate, their hairbreadth escapes, their hardships, privations, and fatigue. They sat talking with them far into the night. Their hostesses hung on every word, their hearts full of admiration and respect for men so brave, so strong and calm, facing death a thousand times without flinching, looking their troubles philosophically in the face, trusting implicitly in their God. The faith of Captain Noddy was sublime. By degrees they got the story of their entering into town from them. It seemed that at this time Pretoria was so well guarded that it was almost impossible for the wiliest of spies to pass through the sentries unobserved. But after much cautious inspection, one single unguarded spot had been found, the drift of the Apes River, over which the Southeast Railway Bridge passed. This drift, which was about twenty feet wide, was so completely fenced in with a network of barbed wire that it was evidently not considered necessary to place sentinels there. By throwing over their parcels first and working away the ground for more than an hour underneath the barbed wire, the men were able to crawl and wriggle their way through the barrier. They made it a rule never to clip the wires around the town, because this would betray the route used by them, but out in the veld no wire fences were spared. When they had removed the worst trace of dust and dirt from their clothes, they walked boldly through the streets. Naughty in the uniform of an English officer, and Ventner and Breckman, as his orderlies, dressed in khaki. They were anxious to get under cover before the full light of day overtook them, but none of them knew where Harmony was, and they actually walked over the lower portion of Harmony's grounds, across the main road, and over the Sunnyside Bridge, hiding themselves in the thick poplar bushes beside the river. Here, three Kaffir police sprang up and saluted Naughty as he passed. But for his uniform, he and his men would have been lost. After a short consultation, it was decided that Breckman should risk walking through the town in daylight to his home in Arcadia, and send someone in the evening to escort Naughty and Venter to Harmony. The two men had a terrible day in the bush, lying as flat as possible in the choking heat, without food, and nothing to drink but a little filthy water in a hole nearby. When night fell, Brenkman sent his sister, with one of Venters, to their hiding place, and then the search for Harmony began. It was the unsuspecting Filippi, lounging about the streets after his day's work was done, who gave the required information and volunteered to show them the way. Before they retired for the night, Naughty took Mrs. Von Warmelow's hand, and looking earnestly into her face, said, Do you know what it means to harbor me? There is a heavy price on my head, and in the event of an attack, I do not mean to be taken alive. There will be a fight under your roof. I am well armed, and he tapped his revolvers significantly. It means confiscation of your property and imprisonment for you and your daughter. Are you prepared for this? If not, say the word. It is not yet too late for us to seek refuge elsewhere. You are heartily welcome here, she replied, and if it comes to fighting... We have arms too, Hansie broke in, a revolver and a pocket pistol. It will not be the first time Boer women have fought side by side with their men. She stopped in some confusion, suddenly remembering General Maxwell and the permits he had given her. I fervently hope there will be no fighting, she continued. I am sure... There will not be. There are too many troops lying around Harmony. We shall never be suspected of harboring spies. But if we should be surprised in the night, don't begin shooting at once. We have a hiding place for you. Mrs. Von Warmelow led the way to her bedroom, where the men were to sleep. And, removing a rug from the floor beside the bed, she lifted two boards and disclosed an opening large enough 
for the body of a man to pass through. Put all your belongings in here and creep in at first alarm, she said. We will cover you up securely. Leave the matter in our hands. By the way, said the captain suddenly, who is Filippi? She gave him a brief outline of Filippi's history and how he came to be at Harmony. Why do you ask? Well, I should like to cultivate Filippi's acquaintance. I must find out what he thinks of how we come to be with you. Oh, Filippi is all right, she declared. You can trust him with anything. But perhaps it will be safer for you to remain in hiding while you are with us, not to be seen even by the servants. We can arrange all that tomorrow, Captain Naughty answered. I am sure you must be tired now, and perhaps you will not get much rest. There are many things to do and discuss tomorrow. I must see several people and give you the reports for the President. Will you let me be your secretary? Hansie asked. I am secretary to the new committee. I shall be very glad if you will, Captain Naughty replied. End of chapter 33「Chapter Thirty Four of the Petticoat Commando by Johanna Brandt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Captain's Visit. Needless to say, there was not much peace or rest for anyone that night. Mrs. Von Warmelo and Hansie kept guard all night in the dining room. Every time Carlo barked outside, they sprang up in alarm, their hearts throbbing, their breath held up in listening suspense. But nothing happened, and when day broke and the glorious sunlight flooded the garden, all their fears vanished, and they felt as if they had been harboring spies all their lives. They were up early, and as soon as their guests heard the sound of life about the house, they cautiously emerged from their rooms, looking about them anxiously and inquiringly. "'Come in and have some coffee,' Mrs. Von Warmelow said warmly. "'Did you have a good night? The servants are not in the house yet, and you are safe for the present. But we must make our plans immediately. Are you going to be seen about the house or not?' Captain Naughty then informed her that his orderly, Venter, wished to go home to his people in Arcadia toward evening, if she could lend him civilian clothing to wear. For once in town, the khaki was more of a danger than a safeguard to him, and Captain Naughty was in the same difficulty himself. It would never do for him to be seen at Harmony in an English officer's uniform, unless, he added inquiringly, you are in the habit of entertaining the British military. No, indeed we are not, she exclaimed indignantly, and told him the story of the officers who had tried to visit her. Only one dear old colonel comes now, Hansie said, but he has not been here for a long, long time. I would enjoy introducing you to him. Not in these clothes, Naughty replied. An English colonel would know at once to whom they belonged. No, if I am to remain at Harmony as an ordinary visitor, you will have to provide me with ordinary clothes. Mrs. Von Warmelow promised to do that during the course of the day, and in the meantime it was decided to keep the men in the unused spare bedroom, out of sight of the prying eyes of servants and possible callers. There their meals were served to them, the women washing up their dishes without a sound in the privacy of their own bedrooms and at the same time doing all in their power to look and act as usual, showing themselves all over the house and garden, and busying themselves with the usual household duties. "'What did those two khaki women want with you last night, Miss Hansie? the irrepressible Filippi asked, as soon as he saw her that morning. "'Khaki women? What do you mean, Filippi? "'They were khaki women,' he said aggressively. "'I saw two English officers with revolvers with them,' and they were pretending that they didn't belong to them. What did they want with Harmony? I don't know them, Filippi. I never set eyes on them before. I am sure they were up to no good. But what did they say they wanted with Harmony? He persisted. They told me they were looking for something else, Hansie answered lamely. Have you fed the fowls, Filippi? No, but I wonder. Then go and do so at once, Hansie interrupted severely. It is long past six o'clock. He went unwillingly. 
On comparing notes, she found that he had carried on the same conversation with her mother. There was no doubt that his suspicions had been thoroughly roused, and for the next few days they had their hands full trying to keep his curiosity in check. Perhaps if they had taken Flippy into their confidence and trusted him with their secret, it would have saved them all the anxiety and unrest they had to pass through afterwards. But they acted for the best, and perhaps they would have been betrayed in any case. What use to speculate now on what might have been? Hansie's first duty that day was to go to town and inform the members of the secret committee of Naughty's arrival in Pretoria, and to procure clothing for Venter. A friend of hers, whom she judged to be about the same size as Venter, gave her a splendid suit of clothes, nearly new, without asking many questions, and placed his further services at her disposal. She then went to Venter's relatives in Arcadia, and told them on no account to visit him at Harmony, as he was coming home to them that evening. Too many people knew about the spies at Harmony, and there was good reason for beginning to feel uncomfortable. The women of the committee promised to call at Harmony that afternoon. When Hansie arrived home, she sewed on Venter's buttons, supplied him with studs and ties, a clean pocket handkerchief, and a new hat. I believe he had on clothing belonging to six different people when he sallied forth soon after sundown, and Mrs. Van Warmelo was glad to see the last of him, for her cares and responsibilities were multiplying, and his presence in the house was one more. The captain was still in his uniform, but he was provided with clean underclothing from the boys' wardrobes, and from that moment the unmistakable smell of commando no longer pervaded that home. The rest of the morning was spent in making copies of the dispatches to the President, and drawing up a list of the necessaries to be provided by the committee for the men to take out with them, and in the afternoon Harmony was besieged with a stream of callers. Poor Hansie thought they would never end, and while she was entertaining them in the drawing-room, her mother was keeping the others quiet in the dining-room, Mrs. Honey, Mrs. Armstrong, Mrs. Malin, and the two spies. That night their sleep was deep and refreshing, for they were worn out in mind and body. There was only one man in the house, and they were getting used to his presence, and the thought of the secret hiding place gave a sense of security. They were up early again next morning, and all the business transactions having been done the day before, they devoted themselves to the entertainment of their guest. A more delightful day they had never spent, and the memory of it clings to them still. Captain Naughty was beginning to feel the restrictions of city hospitality, and longing to get out into the big garden, where the early figs and apricots held their tempting sway. He asked Mrs. Van Warmelo once more to provide him with a suit of civilian clothing. He was taller and slighter of build than the boys, but she gave him a suit belonging to the youngest son, Fritz, and from that moment he walked freely about the house and garden. His helmet and uniform lay buried in the hiding place under the floor, but his revolvers he kept on under his coat, in the leather belt strapped around his waist. This fact was significant of the deadly peril in which they all were. While the women were hastily getting through their household duties in order to have a long talk with him, he roamed about the garden and finally stretched himself out on the benches under the six weeping willows at the foot of the Orange Avenue. "'Who dat lying under our trees, Miss Hansie?' Gentleman Jim inquired from his perch in the mulberry tree behind the house. "'A friend of ours, Jim. He has been very ill in the hospital, and has asked us to let him spend the day in our garden. Oh, yes, I can see him's clothes much too big for him. Hand me that basket, Jim, if it's full, Hansie commanded. Here is another, and when you have finished, make a big fire in the kitchen, because we must have a nice dinner today for the boss. All right, little missy, was the respectful answer. Gentleman Jim was settled and the same performance was gone through casually with Filippi and Paulus, but the three Italian gardeners and the eight or ten Kaffirs employed by them were left to think what they pleased, 
and they went about their work without taking the slightest notice of Captain Naughty. "'The people in your hospital have nice ruddy complexions,' Mrs. Von Warmelo said laughingly, when Hansie told her what the captain was passing for. But the ruse answered, and, for the time at least, all suspicions were lulled to rest. When they joined the captain in the garden later on, they invited him to help them to gather strawberries for the people who were coming to see him again that afternoon. They were just engaged in that pleasant task, chatting gaily and feeling oh so safe, when Mrs. Van Warmelo started violently. The sergeant major was standing on the other side of the fence, watching them intently. Captain Naughty bent low over the strawberry plants and whispered, "'Don't move. Go on picking quietly. He will soon go away.' He did, apparently satisfied with the appearance of the stranger, but the ladies had been seized with a sudden nervousness and implored the captain to come into the house. Mrs. Van Warmelo pointed out to him a group of dense loquat trees, with dark, green, glossy foliage, a suitable place for refuge should he be compelled to flee from the house at night. He was not a man of many words, but once started, there was no difficulty in getting all the information they wanted out of him, and he answered their leading questions in a simple, straightforward way, his every word bearing the unmistakable stamp of truth. I have avoided going into the details of the actual war as much as possible. It has not been my intention to weary my reader with the dry facts concerning battlefields, nor to give the war reports and war rumors so often unreliable with which Hansie's diary is filled. But the events connected with Captain Naughty's first visit to Harmony I wish to give in the smallest detail. Great historical truths stand out in bold relief against a background of minute details and the realistic description of the common life. This background, Hansie's diary, affords better than anything written from memory after many years could have done. While the captain slept, Hansie made her notes, and when he awoke, she was with him again for further news. Her thirst for information was insatiable. I have been longing to ask you, Captain, where you got your English uniform, Hansie said, as they sat down in the dining room with the great bowl of scarlet strawberries before them. Tell us everything while we remove these stems. You have heard of the terrible battle we had at Bacon Locked, when Colonel Benson fell mortally wounded. I was there. Were you? they exclaimed in breathless surprise. Yes, and the uniform lying buried under your floor I myself took from the dead body of Colonel Thorord after the battle. By degrees a full description was given of that great British reverse on the high veld, and what took place after. When the battle was over, and Colonel Benson lay mortally wounded, surrounded by doctors and officers in high authority, Naughty advanced and asked to be allowed to take his papers. The men protested, but Naughty ordered them all aside and gently removed every paper from his pockets. He had no important documents with him, and the private papers were, of course, returned to the men in charge of the dying officer. He expired soon afterwards and was mourned by the Boers as well as the English, for he was admired and respected by all for his courage and daring, and his fame as an honorable foe had spread throughout the Boer lines. Many of them were heard to say that they had only meant to catch him and that they bitterly regretted his death. It was one of the worst battles under General Botha Naughty had ever been in. About twelve Boers were killed instantly and three wounded to death. With the storming of the cannon, Boers and English were so close together that one could hear what the other said, and Naughty's corporal, Venter, saw a poor soldier fall back, mortally wounded, gasping out with his dying breath, Oh, dear mother! God of pity, who will tell that bereaved parent that her son's last thoughts and words were for her alone? It was terrible to hear the wounded and dying praying and calling to their God for help. Nationality, language, enmity, and bitter hatred were forgotten as side by side those mortal foes prepared to meet their God, one God. 
imploring one another for help, praying for one drop of water to alleviate their dying agonies in vain. Two cannon were taken by the Boers, one of which they destroyed at once, keeping the other for their future use. When all was over, General Botha spoke a few touching words to his men, thanking them for their bravery and congratulating them on their success. Unpleasant though it may be to think of it, it is my duty to relate that, before burial, the soldiers were stripped of their clothes, and every Boer was permitted to take what he required, but the bodies were treated with respect. Naughty, for purposes of his own, chose the uniform of the dead Colonel Thorold, which had six bullet holes through it and was covered with bloodstains. Revolvers, leggings, whistle, helmet, all was complete, even to the stars and crown on the Colonel's shoulders. Naughty felt himself rich indeed in the possession of articles which he knew would be invaluable to him on his next entry into Pretoria. One of his men took Colonel Benson's uniform, but handed the crown to him, Naughty, at his request, and then the bodies were covered with blankets for a hurried burial. O oh, cruel war, when men slay one another! O oh, blessed Red Cross, like an angel in the trail of the men who slay! There were about ten dead English officers on the field and nineteen wounded, of whom three or four died afterwards. "'When did you see General Botha last?' Mrs. von Wormelow inquired. "'About three weeks ago, and then he was looking well and brown. He told me of a narrow escape he had had. He was completely surrounded and barely got off with his life. His hat was left behind, also his Bible and hymn books. Lord Kitchener courteously, and with a touch of humor, returned the books to him with a boy's hat which had been found on the field, thinking evidently that it belonged to the general's little son, who was known to go everywhere with him. But General Botha sent the hat back to Lord Kitchener with a message to the effect that it was not his son's, but had belonged to his actor rider, and thanking him for the books. "'Tell us of some of your own escapes,' Hansie begged. "'I am sure you have had many.' "'So many that I have forgotten nearly all,' he answered. "'But one I shall never forget.' He then related how he and twenty of his men had been pursued for four hours by about one thousand English. The bullets fell like hail about them, and he was keeping the saddle he rode on as a curiosity because of the many bullet holes in it. Once a bullet passed between his coat and shirt along his stomach, the shock taking his breath away. He was sure he had been mortally wounded, but could not stop to find out and the very recollection of it still caused him to experience the sensation of coming in close contact with death. Footnote. General Botha tells me that the hat which was returned to him by Lord Kitchener had first belonged to his little son, Louis, who had written his name in full in blue pencil on the inside of the crown, and had given it, when he had no more use for it, to his little native orderly. End of chapter 34《Chapter Thirty Five of the Petticoat Commando by Johanna Brandt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memories Bittersweet. The captain's visit was not an unmixed joy. Some bitter revelations were made. Much pathos mixed with the humors of the situation and tragic experiences related by all. But on these I shall merely touch as unavoidable and necessary for the completion of my story. After the treachery of their own people and the arming of the natives, nothing troubled the men so much as the fact that the fighting burghers were, in some parts of the country, suffering from sore gums and showing signs of scurvy, caused by an unchanging diet of meat and mealies. The spies wanted to communicate this to some good, trustworthy doctor, and to get medicine for them to take out to the commandos. But Mrs. von Wormelow told them that no medicine in the world could cure that. What they wanted was a change of diet, fresh milk, vegetables, fruit, and an abundant supply of lime juice, etc. 
Sending out lime juice would be as absurd as impossible, for it would be as a drop in the ocean of want. And, as it was, the men were handicapped by the two bottles of good French brandy, which they were taking out for medicinal purposes. These could not be thrown across with the other parcels, but would have to be carried on their persons as they wriggled through the bobbed wire across the drift of the Apes River. In some districts, where the destruction of farms had not yet been completed, the commandos found a sufficient supply of fresh fruit and vegetables, and were in no immediate danger of the dread disease. But in the neighborhood of the towns, there was nothing more to be done in the way of devastation, and the only fresh food they got was what they took from the enemy. As an instance of the thoroughness of the system of destruction, Naughty related how he and his corps of hungry men had one day come upon a corral containing the bodies of over 500 sheep in an advanced stage of decomposition, with their throats cut or their heads cleft in two by swords, too far away from towns or camps to be driven to some place where they could have been kept for the use of starving and suffering humanity, they had been slaughtered and left to rot. Anything to prevent their falling into the hands of the Boer commandos. No provisions of any sort were left within their reach, and they lived entirely on what they took by main force from the enemy. A precarious existence, indeed. Not to know from day to day where the next meal would come from, and with appetites sharpened by the healthy roving outdoor life they led. No wonder these men uttered imprecations on the heads of those responsible for the systematic devastation of the country and wholesale destruction of food. The privilege, too, of stripping their prisoners of their clothes had its disadvantages, for in many cases they swarmed with vermin and had to be boiled before they could be used, while a camp deserted by the English had to be approached warily and with the utmost caution on account of the vermin with which it was frequently infested. English prisoners were set free. What could the Boers do with them otherwise? But traitors, caught with them red-handed, were shot without mercy, and it was Naughty's duty, as captain of the Secret Service, to see that these executions were carried out. This was to him the hardest task of all. His fallen brothers, he called them, and voice and eye when he spoke of them betrayed compassionate horror and wrath unspeakable. Armed natives met the same fate, and in a few words he described to his shuddering listeners how it was done, how he informed the doomed man of his fate, how the prisoner pleaded for mercy and offered to join the Boer ranks, how he prayed in despair when he found no mercy, no relenting, how he covered his face or folded his arms how the shots rang out, and he fell down dead. Scenes such as these were witnessed without number, but the execution of a fallen brother, when the details were arranged, took place some distance apart, beyond the vision of the burghers who had captured him. But it was when the subject of the concentration camps was broached that the darkest gloom settled over Harmony. Captain Naughty had a young wife and two children in one of the camps in Natal, and Mrs. Malan had procured, as a surprise for him, snapshots of his dear ones taken in the camp. When they were placed in his hands, he gazed on them for a long time in silence, finally muttering under his breath, For this the English must die, and from that moment he was moody and silent. His thirst for information on the condition of the Irene camp, as Hansey had found it, was insatiable, and hours were spent in discussing the subject and its probable effect on the duration of the war. "'What do the men think of the concentration camps?' Hansey asked. "'Will they give in for the sake of the women and children?' "'No,' was the emphatic answer. "'Never. We all feel that our first duty is to fight until our independence is assured.' We are not responsible for the fate of our women and children, and they let no opportunity pass of urging us to be brave and steadfast in the fulfillment of our duty to our country. Our spies come from the camps continually with messages of encouragement and hope, but that the mortality among them is more bitter to bear than anything else you can understand. 
There was a long pause, and then the captain continued gloomily. I did not recognize my wife on that photo. She has become an old, old woman. Sometimes on commando we actually enjoy ourselves. You must not think that it is all hardship and trouble. I gave a concert, quite a good one, on the president's birthday, and occasionally when we come to a farm where there are still some girls left, we take them out riding and driving. End of chapter 35「Chapter Thirty Six of the Petticoat Commando by Johanna Brandt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A silent departure. Fare thee well. As the afternoon wore on, an extreme nervousness came over all at Harmony, a feeling of tense anxiety which no words can describe was betrayed in a restless flitting through the house, arranging something here, peering through the blinds at the camp of the military mounted police. Unconsciously, voices were lowered and final instructions given in hushed tones. Only a few hours remained of the captain's visit to Harmony, and much still had to be arranged. The tension was broken by the arrival of Mrs. Malan, with large parcels containing the articles of clothing, etc., ordered by Naughty, hats, boots, riding suits, soap, matches, salt, and a number of the small necessities of life. This gave the women something to do, for everything had to be sorted and made up in the smaller parcels as compactly as possible, while Naughty donned a surprising quantity of clothing and disposed of various articles about his person. In the excitement of the moment, Captain Naughty, while he was dressing, must have forgotten to take off a waistcoat lent to him by Mrs. Van Warmelo and clearly marked D.S. Van Warmelo. This caused her a great deal of anxiety for some days after the departure of the spies. Had Naughty reached the commandos in safety, or had he fallen into the hands of the enemy with the tell-tale waistcoat on? They wondered and speculated, but as the days went by and no startling reports convulsed the town, they once again settled down. Not to the same old sense of security as far as they were personally concerned, but to the comforting conviction that all was well with their friends. Their own fate? But this is coming presently. Mrs. Malan did not stay long, and there were fortunately no unexpected visitors that afternoon, except, strange to say, the English colonel, who had but all ceased his visits, and was on this occasion entertained by Hansie and her mother in turn. His presence gave a great sense of security. Hansie walked with Mrs. Malan to the gate, where her carriage was waiting for her, and the sergeant major, slowly sauntering past and saluting to the girl as she gave the coachman her directions, little knew that the words spoken in Dutch were, you must be here at seven tonight, and bring your residential pass without fail. Vander Westhuizen, with the bandaged arm, was going to help to carry their parcels through the bush, and escort the three men through the most dangerous parts of the town. When all the preparations were complete, there was an hour or two to spare before the other men, under the cover of darkness, should join Naughty near the six willow trees at the foot of the orchard. The time was spent in making plans for the future. "'Promise me that you will never take in strange men,' Naughty said earnestly. "'Do not even harbor anyone who professes to come from me unless he gives a watchword. What shall our watchword be?' They thought for a few moments, and then Mrs. Van Warmelo said, "'Apple coos, apricots, because you came to us in the apricot season.' "'So be it.' This was agreed upon. And if anything should happen to us before you come again? Hansie inquired. By what sign will you know that we have been taken and that harmony is a pitfall instead of a refuge? Again they pondered. This was indeed a serious problem, for in the event of an arrest they would not be allowed to see or communicate with any of their friends, and there would be no possible chance of sending out a warning. After a great deal of discussion, it was decided that they should use one of the posts of the enclosure 
dividing the upper part of Harmony, where the orchard was, from the lower, on which the vegetable gardens of the Italians were. On one of the posts they would, if they had time to do so, fasten a small piece of plank, and this would serve as a warning to the men not to approach the house. In case the enemy was not considerate enough to give them time to put up signs and signals, it was agreed to have this done at dead of night by one of the few remaining men in town, van der Westhuizen, for instance, at the first news of their arrest. This arrangement eased their minds of some anxiety, and the rest of the time was spent in quietly chatting about other matters. "'I suppose you could not let my wife know that I have been here and am well?' Naughty asked. "'I'm afraid not,' Mrs. Van Wormelo answered thoughtfully. "'We know no one in the camp in which she is, and her correspondence will no doubt be closely watched. But we could write an ordinary cheerful letter urging her to be hopeful and strong. "'Thank you very much,' he said gratefully. "'But do not use your own names on my account. Get other people to write.' people less implicated than yourselves. Towards seven o'clock, Hansie walked slowly down to the willows, the faithful Carlo by her side, wistfully looking into her face. Did he feel the suppressed agitation, the unrest in the air? I do believe Carlo knew and felt every changing emotion in his young mistress, and sympathized or rejoiced accordingly. There was no one in the garden. Hansie waited ten minutes, twenty, half an hour, and then she went back to the house. There, the form of a tall young man in his English officer's uniform, from which the traces of blood had been removed as well as possible, was to be seen walking to and fro in restless nervousness. "'Have the others not come yet?' he exclaimed impatiently. "'Where can they be so late?' "'I think it is too light still for them to be abroad,' Hansie answered." You should have made the appointment for eight o'clock. But then the moon will be up, he objected. I hope they will be here soon. Hansie once more walked to the six willows, and the next half hour was spent in a restless pacing up and down between the orange trees of the avenue. Will they never come? Have they fallen into some unforeseen pitfall? At this, the most critical moment of our whole adventure when all arrangements seemed to have come to a smooth and successful termination, must our plans be frustrated and a bloody encounter be the climax? Hansie walked boldly towards the military camp, whistling to Carlo and admonishing him thus audibly. "'Why can't you leave the kittens alone, Carlo?' Then more softly. "'A peaceful serenity pervades the camp. Evidently nothing brewing here.' With a lighter heart she went back to the house, but one glance at the face of the captain was enough, and once more she sped down the garden path to the ill-fated trysting place. As she neared the spot she heard no sound of life, and her heart once more sank, but only for a moment. Suddenly she started violently. What is this? The place seemed in a moment alive with silent figures. From the depths of the overhanging willow branches they emerged, one by one, and approached the tense form of the girl, as she stood immovable, with straining eyes trying to distinguish the moving, silent figures in the darkness. The white dress of a woman fluttering among the leaves reassured her. "'What is this?' she whispered. "'Who are you? Why are you here?' One of the men came forward. "'Venter and Breckman,' he said softly, "'come for the captain.' "'Yes, yes, Hansie,' said hurriedly. "'I know. We have waited for you more than an hour. "'But these people, who are they?' "'Our friends and relatives come to see us off,' came the unexpected reply. "'Hansie was silent, trying to hide her indignation, her rising resentment, "'as another and yet another form cautiously emerged from behind the foliage. "'Do you know,' she said at last, that you are not only exposing us to great danger by coming here at a time like this, but that you are making it a thousand times more difficult for the captain to depart unobserved. How could you be so indiscreet? These people are all trustworthy, one of the men volunteered. I have no doubt of it, Hansie extended her hand cordially to them, but you must all go now, as quietly as you came. Say good-bye, 
and go, please, before I go to call the captain. She turned away with a lump in her throat, for no sound broke the stillness of the night save those of stifled sobs and murmured caresses. Fare thee well. God be with you. There was Breckman with his three sisters. There was Venter with one sister and a sweetheart. And there was the sweetheart of one of Breckman's sisters, to say nothing of the other relatives and friends whom I have been unable to place. Some distance from the scene, and unobserved by all save one, was the figure of the ever-cautious and discreet van der Westhuizen, guarding the parcels which had previously been conveyed there, lurking among the trees. Swiftly and silently, Hansie sped up to the house to meet the captain, just as he, unable to bear the suspense any longer, had made up his mind to set out on his perilous expedition alone, and was cautiously emerging from the bathroom door, concealing himself under the vineyard as he went. "'They are there, Captain,' she said, in a quick and lowered voice, waiting for you under the willows. Lower, down near the bush, van der Westhuizen is also waiting. He will distribute the parcels when you come. I think everything is in order, and the coast clear. The military camp is quiet. The sergeant major is in his tin villa. Goodbye, Captain. God bless you. The man removed his helmet and stood before her in the pale light of the rising moon. His face was very white. I shall never be able to thank you. God keep you. Goodbye, goodbye. He clasped her hand and was gone, as silent as the shadows into which he disappeared. When Hansie rejoined her mother a few minutes later, no word was said on either side. The extreme tension was over. The reaction had set in and they could not trust themselves to speak. But they set to work at once, firmly and decently, removing every trace in the house of confusion and disorder. In the room vacated by Captain Naughty, they found the snapshots of his wife and children taken in the concentration camp. Mrs. Von Warmelo held them up to her daughter's view with a significant look. "'I am not surprised that he would not take them with him,' she said." End of chapter 36「Chapter 37 of the Petticoat Commando by Johanna Brandt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Betrayed. Hansi was one of those unfortunate women who cannot cry, but I believe she cried that night when the awful strain was over, the house quiet and deserted and the feeling of nothing to do but wait creeping over her. She and her mother lay for hours, listening for sounds of commotion in the suburb, following in spirit the brave men on their route to the free veld, so perilous and insecure, watching and praying for their safety. At last, Hansie fell into a heavy, unrefreshing sleep, from which she was roused in the early dawn by her mother's voice, hurried, and extremely agitated. Hansie, Hansie, come here quick. Where, mother? Where are you? In the dining room. Come at once. Come and look. Hansie sprang out of bed, alarmed, and now thoroughly roused, and ran into the dining room, where she found her mother concealing herself behind the lace curtains and cautiously looking out of the window to the military camp. She half turned as her daughter approached and said in a whisper, "'Don't show yourself. Look, Hansie, we have been betrayed. Our house is suspected. See how it is being watched.' Hansie looked and looked again. There was no doubt of it. The sergeant was in excited conversation with a man on horseback, well known to Hansie by sight as a detective in plain clothes. Here and there the soldiers were grouped around other private detectives, on horseback and on foot, talking and gesticulating and pointing to the house in wild excitement. What struck Hansie as almost ludicrous, even at that moment, was the unbounded astonishment betrayed by them. Their looks and gestures spoke as plainly as the plainest words. Can it be possible? Had that been going on under our noses? And pray, how long? There is no doubt about it. We and our house have been betrayed. But cheer up, mother. Forewarned is forearmed. 
Oh, silly fools, to give away their game like that. They have not seen us yet, Hansie. They think we are asleep. Even so, the servants are about. Oh, mother. Go and get dressed, Hansie, and let us behave exactly the same as usual. All we can do now is to see that we do not betray that we know we have been betrayed. How do you think this has come about? The crowd under the willows last night? Gentleman Jim? Philippi? They looked at one another inquiringly and slowly shook their heads. Good reader, after more than ten years, when they talk about this period of their lives, they still look inquiringly at one another and slowly shake their heads. Who could it have been? How did it come about? When Hansie went out into the garden an hour or so later to gather roses for the table, Harmony was flooded with the exquisite morning sun. The birds were twittering and bickering among themselves, and Carlo sprang up to meet her, barking an affectionate good morning, as he playfully capered round his mistress. As she stooped down to pat him, she glanced through her hair to the camp, where some of the men were bending over their campfires, and others were rubbing down and feeding their horses. Will you believe it? At the first sight of the girl, every man dropped his work, stood up straight, and stared at her in open-mouthed astonishment, as if he had never seen her before. They even got together again in little groups of twos and threes, and began talking rapidly to one another. Their amazement, their consternation was so obvious that Hansie found it difficult to pretend that she saw nothing unusual in their behavior, and when she joined her mother at the breakfast table, and told her what a commotion her appearance had created, Mrs. Van Warmelo said, It is the same with me. Whenever I show myself under the verandas or in the garden, I am met with stares that can only be described as thunderstruck. And that, after all the months they have spent within earshot of all that went on at Harmony. Why, mother, those men have never lifted their heads when we have passed them for a year and more. They had got so used to us but now she went on more seriously we can never be thankful enough that you found this out in time the members of the committee must be warned not to come to harmony but we must invite lots of other people let us give a few fruit parties and musical evenings for the young people and above all let us invite the consuls and their families hansie was feeling hopeful buoyed up by the unlooked-for privilege of having been put on her guard. But Mrs. Van Warmelo was silent and depressed. "'I am thinking about the spies,' she said at last. "'How can we ever harbor them here again? How can we let them know that harmony is being watched? How shall we get through the anxiety and suspense when we begin to expect them again?' Naughty's last words to me were, "'We shall be with you in four weeks from now.' when the moon is young again. Hansie looked thoughtful, but brightened up again immediately. We have always the sign at the gatepost to fall back on, you know, mother dear, but I hope it won't be necessary to put that up. In the meantime, let us watch developments. We have nothing to be anxious about yet, and when the time comes, we shall know what to do. Just think how terrible it would have been if this had happened yesterday, while Naughty was in the house. But poor Mrs. Von Warmelow could not shake off her gloom, and Hansie, who, strange to say, was usually most hopeful and strong in the presence of depressed folk, but pessimistic and downhearted when others were most bright, sighed for once and allowed herself to be cast down by her mother's forebodings. They realized that an anxious time was before them. Their worst fear being that Naughty and his companions had been captured the previous night, and that some time would probably elapse before they knew with any certainty what his fate had been. That they were safe in his hands they never doubted for a moment, but there were too many others, practically unknown to them, concerned in this enterprise, and every conspirator, more added to the list, made their own position less secure. I think I must go to Miss Jobert this afternoon, mother, to see if I can get a hold of van der Westhuizen. Perhaps he can throw some light on the subject. At any rate, he will be able to tell us 
whether he parted from Naughty under favorable conditions last night. Do that, Mrs. Van Warmelo answered, if you can make sure beforehand of not being watched. Do not go to that house if you have any reason to think you are being followed. We are on the blacklist now, but that makes it all the more necessary for us to protect our friends. Yes, mother, but the Joe Bears have been under suspicion so long and have so successfully escaped detection that I am sure their names have long since been removed from the blacklist. Don't be too sure. Janie's transportation was not a sign of the cessation of hostilities. The enemy is not asleep, but merely slumbering. As far as they are concerned, that is, if this thing, waving her hand over harmony, has not roused him completely. All day long, and in fact for many days after, an unusual commotion was apparent in the military camp. Detectives could be seen coming and going, little groups of soldiers clustered together, and even Judas Boers made their appearance on the lower portion of Harmony, examining the ground and following the tracks made by the spies in their escape from the town. Beyond that, the Van Warmelos could not follow their investigations, and whether they found conclusive evidence in the marks made by the men at the closely barbed and netted drift under the railway bridge will never be known, but there was reason to believe that the last remaining route of the spies had been discovered. Brave hearts sank at the thought of their probable fate when they tried that route again. But thank God, the birds had flown, for the time at least. That afternoon, when Hansie cycled to Miss Jobert's house, the streets were quiet and practically deserted. She was quite sure that no one followed her, for she dropped her handkerchief once and had suddenly to turn and pick it up. Carlo was some way ahead of her and did not notice the interruption until she was on her bicycle again, when he came tearing back to find out what had happened, furious with himself for having missed the smallest piece of excitement. After that, he did not leave her side again, but trotted quietly along, watching her every movement from the corner of his eye. When Hansie entered the house in Visagi Street, Carlo stretched himself as usual beside her bicycle, ostensibly to sleep, but in reality on guard and alert with every nerve in his quick body. Hansie was thankful to find van der Westhuizen in. In fact, he was expecting her and wished to see her, but did not think it advisable to go to Harmony. "'Tell me all about last night,' she said. "'Tell me everything. And then I have something to tell you, too.' Well, he said, and the inscrutable face, for once, turned to her in frank confidence. After we left Harmony last night, things did not go as smoothly as we expected. It was all right as long as we were in the bush, and we were able to get our heavy parcels through safely. But when we came to the drift, we found it strongly guarded. We retreated at once without a sound, and lay down in the thick shrub to wait. The men were nervous and impatient and after a while Breckman borrowed my residential pass from me and walked on ahead to see if the coast were clear. He soon came back and said it was impossible to get through. After a short consultation, Naughty advised me to come home. They would stay in the bush and wait until the moon went down, he said. I hated leaving them in such a plight, but Naughty insisted and I only came away when he said he thought there would be more chance for them to get through unobserved if they were fewer in number. How they managed without residential passes and handicapped by those parcels, I do not know. God only knows how they do manage, Hansie answered somberly. Well, I have nothing good to relate either. She told him in a few words what had happened at Harmony, and the steadfast face opposite her so calm and strong, grew more grave as she proceeded. This is very serious, he said at last. Then the fact of their being in town and the route they had taken must have been known by the enemy yesterday. That is why we found the drift guarded. But do not be downcast. I am sure they got through unharmed, for there has been no commotion of any sort in town. I always know when prisoners have been taken. We must be thankful they were not discovered in your house. Hansie nodded, and the quiet voice went on. 
You are in no danger now. But the girl broke in impetuously. Oh, that does not trouble me at all. But I would give my life to know that those men were with General Botha now. I am only anxious about them. I am not, he answered. The captain is a man of vast experience. This was not his first visit to Pretoria. Ventner has been five times in Pretoria and nine times in Johannesburg under the same conditions. Brinkman, too, can speak of unique experiences. But I can bet you anything that he will never come in again. Why not? Oh, he had an awful time here. There are khakis and hand suppers living all around his house, to some of whom he is well known by sight. It was found necessary to conceal him, and for three days and two nights the poor boy was stowed away in a tiny attic, just under the corrugated iron roof, and hardly large enough to hold a man. There he lay in the suffocating heat of those endless days, only coming out at night for a few hours, like the bats and owls. No, he won't trouble us again. Before she left, she told him what had been arranged about the sign on the gatepost, and asked van der Westhuizen to warn her friends of the inner circle that Harmony was no longer a safe place to visit, begging them to keep this information to themselves, because, she added, the enemy must not know that we know. Later on she hoped to see him again, when the time approached for Naughty to come again. But she advised him not to visit Harmony unnecessarily, as much would depend upon him in the event of a raid on Harmony and the transportation of its inhabitants to other regions. I can only say in conclusion of this chapter that the friends of the inner circle, Mrs. Malan, Mrs. Jobert, Mrs. Armstrong, Mrs. Honey, and a few others, bravely scorned the idea of avoiding Harmony. Why should we not come? Mrs. Armstrong asked, with her cheerful, ever-ready laugh. Don't other people come here still? Oh, yes, but... Then why not we? The more the better, say I. Surely we cannot all be arrested and sent away. End of chapter 37「Chapter thirty eight of the Petticoat Commando by Johanna Brandt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Raid on Harmony. It was the peacefulest, decentest raid I ever heard of, and it would be difficult to think of anything with a termination more tame and commonplace. But we have not got there yet. The events which led up to it must be got over first as briefly as possible, and then we go on to what was called a formal declaration of war between the inmates of the military camp and the two principal actors at Harmony. After the Van Warmelos had discovered on December 20th, through the enemy's rank stupidity, that they had been found out, a regular game of hide-and-seek began to be played in and around their beautiful garden. The curious thing about this game was that it was only carried on under cover of darkness an intense silence, a silence which could almost be felt, and which became so uncanny as time went on that the women found it quite insupportable and had no peace by night or day, until the day on which, a month later, the enemy took the initiative and made what may be called an attack in front. There was only one noisy actor in the game, which was played for four solid weeks before the crash came, and as many after and that was Carlo. But although his feelings found relief in constant growling and furious barking, I do believe even his nerves suffered under the constant strain, for he became more and more irritable and restless as time went on. The dog gave a lot of trouble in those days, and was a source of great anxiety, as my reader will see presently. The fruit season was at its height. The garden, heavily laden with the burden of luscious fruits and blooming flowers, was a scene of beauty and riotous luxury impossible to describe. And as the different fruit trees bloomed and bore their rich harvest in rapid succession, each after its kind, apricots, figs, pears, plums, apples, peaches, and last but not least, the noble vine, with its great bunches of purple and white, Hansie and her mother 
reveled in the wealth of nature's extravagance from morn till eve. Mrs. von Wormelow, an energetic and tireless gardener, spent all of her time amongst the fruits. While indoors, the task of putting up in jars for winter use fell mainly on Hansie's shoulders. Nothing was allowed to run to waste, and that year was always remembered as an exceptionally fine fruit season. It was nothing for Mrs. von Wormelow to have 100 pounds of grapes cut before breakfast and have them conveyed to the early market, and even then the vines bore no trace of having been robbed or tampered with. The soldiers, too, got their share, and the sergeant major's small basket was often filled, for were they not on the best of terms with one another? But when the shades of night fell over the land and silence settled on the birds and beasts and flowers, the sense of careless freedom and security deserted our heroines entirely. Unseen eyes watched them from behind the leaves, and they knew that the very tree under which they sat had ears, straining to catch up their every conversation. The military police, unknown to the women, as they thought, were guarding them and their property from intruders, and this was known by Carlo's incessant growlings and his furious sudden fits of barking whenever he came upon some midnight prowler hidden under the trees. I am sure the good dog never understood Hansie's apathy on this point. After all he did to warn her of foul play, to have his efforts rewarded with a scolding or a careless, do be quiet, Carlo, the kitty is only catching moths, seemed unjust and quite unlike his mistress's usually ready sympathy. In time, he got used to finding strangers in the privacy of his domain, and only showed his dissatisfaction with an occasional low growl or vicious snarl. Perhaps Gentleman Jim was not so bad after all, or perhaps he was only stupid, because a few days after the flight of our friends, he came to Mrs. Van Wormelo with the information, given with an amused smile and more drawl than usual, that the officer had promised him plenty money if he ever caught a boar on the premises or in the garden, and that in future a strict watch would be held over the property, and extra vigilance preserved whenever the dog barked. What more proof could be wanted after that? Now they knew exactly how the land lay, and in their hearts they thanked their simple servant and still more simple foe for the confirmation of their suspicions. As the weeks went by and the time for the captain's next visit drew near, Mrs. von Wormelow again and again urged the necessity of putting up the danger signal, a small block of wood, which was kept ready with a nail through it, lying hidden behind the post, only to be met with an obstinate refusal from her daughter. "'How can you be so reckless and foolhardy, Hansie?' her mother would exclaim. "'We know that the men may come in any night.' and we know that the house and grounds are being watched. And yet you want me to let our friends run right into the trap without lifting a finger to save them. It would be an unpardonable thing, and I do believe you are only longing to have the excitement of harboring spies again. Hansie laughed. Perhaps that is it. But think of the disappointment of the men to be turned back at our very doors after having come so far through untold dangers. Depend upon it, they will not come in again for nothing. They went through too much last time, and there will be work of some importance for us to do if they come in again. You may be sure of that. No, dear mother, let us risk it, I beg of you. We are still in the house, and Naughty is no chicken. He will reach us in spite of guards and fences, and but followed right up to the house and be taken here like a rat in a trap, Mrs. Van Wormelo continued gloomily. I am not so sure, Hansie exclaimed, as cheerfully as her sinking heart allowed, when this horrible picture rose before her. You know what our experience has been of English vigilance and English sagacity. Now if they had some of Carlos's intelligence, we would have some reason to be anxious. The danger signal was not put up, but that things would have ended exactly as Mrs. von Wormelow had predicted, I now have not a shadow of doubt. 
the spies would have glided into the house in the false security occasioned by the absence of the danger signal. They would have been watched and followed to the very doors by the hidden foe. The house would have been surrounded and stormed by armed men, and a fierce and unspeakably horrible encounter would have ended in death and destruction if they had come. But they were prevented on commando from keeping their appointment that month, and at the very time when they expected to be safely housed under Harmony's hospitable roof, the place was surrounded, an entry forced, and every corner of the house searched for spies. It happened like so, and we must now turn our attention for a moment to a matter of small importance in order to understand why Hansie was from home at a critical time, and how she missed the keen enjoyment of being present at the raid. For some weeks the advisability of leaving home on a pleasure trip had been discussed. While the moon was on the wane, their friends from commando would not be likely to pay them a visit, but Mrs. Von Warmelow, who never had much inclination to leave her little paradise, persuaded Hansie to go to Johannesburg for a few days alone to a dear young friend, newly wed, who had repeatedly begged her to come. They hoped that such an attitude of innocent pleasure-making on their part would avert some of the suspicion which rested on their heads and cause a part, at least, of the surveillance to be withdrawn from harmony. Hansie hoped to be back home before the appearance of the new moon, the time appointed for Naughty's next visit, and it was red tape, nothing but red tape, through which she was undone. So many difficulties were placed in the way of her obtaining the necessary permits that by the time she got away she should have been on her return journey. Let us see what her diary says. January 10th, Friday. My poor old diary, I begin to foresee that it is going to die a natural death simply because I am tired of recording lies and rumors. This was the black and white diary, kept on purpose to mislead the enemy, should it fall into their hands. I am now busy preparing for a little trip to Johannesburg, but, oh dear, the difficulty one has in getting permits. The English have never been so strict before. Major Hoskins, who could have helped me without further reference, had he wished, sent me to the Commissioner of Police, who asked me to produce a note of recommendation from my ward officer in B Ward. My ward officer refused to give me a permit without a medical certificate that I required a change of air. I told him shortly that I was going for pleasure and that I would appeal to General Maxwell if he could not assist me. He said that made all the difference. What did he mean? And asked me for the name and address of the people with whom I would be staying in Johannesburg. So I gave him Pauline's box number. No, that was not sufficient. He must have the name of the street and the number of the house. I do not remember the number, but I shall go home to look it up and come back at once. It will be more convenient if you bring it in tomorrow, he said. And hence he understood that he was gaining time. After all the fuss that had been made, she was not surprised next day when the commissioner of police asked her very politely, while closely inspecting the note of recommendation, to call for her permits on Monday. This was Thursday, as there would be some delay in having them approved by the other officials. This was again done to gain time, while the authorities were putting their heads together, trying to find out what the dickens she could want in Johannesburg. Hansie knew this well enough, although she filled her diary with lamentations and wonderings. "'Will you be all right alone, mother, at a time like this?' Hansie asked. With her permits at last in her possession, she hugged her mother in affectionate farewell. "'Oh, yes, I am well guarded, as you know,' Mrs. Von Wormelow answered, laughing. "'There is plenty of time, and you will be back before anything can happen.' Hansie looked doubtful. Was her mother play-acting? Did she mind being left? And was she only eager to have her daughter out of danger's way? Or did she intend putting up the danger signal after all? You see, Hansie was getting so used to plotting and scheming 
that she could not help turning her newly acquired detective propensities on her nearest and dearest, when occasion offered, and she even misdoubted the behavior of her mother, tried as she had been, and never found wanting in many a crisis in the past. "'You will wire for me, won't you?' she asked suspiciously. "'Of course, of course. But there will be nothing to wire about, I am quite sure.' With a sigh and many anxious forebodings, Hansi drove to the station on her way to her pleasure trip. She was met in the Golden City, now more like a dead city, by loving friends and a magnificent St. Bernard dog, Nero, who soon made her feel at home, although they could not altogether banish the cares dimly guessed at by them with which she was oppressed. The most reassuring news from home continued to reach her until one morning on the sixth day after her arrival, a brief postcard from her mother informed her in a few bald words that Harmony had been searched on Sunday morning, the 19th instant. A few hours later, Hansie was in the train, speeding, with remorse tugging at her heart, to her mother's side. It was something of a disappointment to her on arriving at Harmony to find everything exactly as she had left it. Carlo greeted her with his old extravagant demonstrations of affection and delight, and when she looked searchingly into her mother's face, she was met with a beaming smile. There was no trace of the ordeal she had faced alone, and Hansie's anxious heart gave a throb of relief. She was soon in full possession of the details of the adventure, and it appeared that the raid had been made in the early hours of the 19th January, Sunday morning. It had been raining heavily all night, and the torrents were still coming down drenchingly when Mrs. Van Warmelo was aroused by a knock at her bedroom window, and Gentleman Jim's voice, with all the draw gone, calling out anxiously, "'Missy, come, the police want you.' Mrs. Van Warmelo dressed hurriedly, and on opening the front door was met by an officer, who informed her that he had been ordered by the Commissioner of Police to search her house. Armed soldiers were standing about, guarding the different entrances. Mrs. Van Warmelo led the way, and the officer went through the house with her alone, glancing under beds, opening wardrobes, and moving screens in his search for men, as he said in reply to her questions. "'I am surprised that you should have been sent to search my house for men,' she said with righteous indignation. "'I was surprised to see your name on the blacklist, Mrs. Van Warmelo,' he answered. She watched him in puzzled silence. Evidently he knew her, or her name. Quite evidently he was no Englishman. Only a South African could pronounce her name like that. When they reached the passage leading to the kitchen, the officer suddenly started at the sight of Filippi's form, lying curled up in deep sleep. He bent over him, pulled the blanket down cautiously, and said below his breath, Oh, a boy. The house having been thoroughly searched, he turned to Mrs. Von Warmelow and, courteously thanking her for having allowed him to do so, asked permission to go through the outbuildings, which was instantly granted. There was no one, of course, and the military, if they had expected to make any sensational discoveries that morning, were grievously disappointed. "'Well, I am glad it is over, Mama," Hansie said, when the story came to an end. "'It is better to have the house searched in vain than not to have it searched at all, when one is on the blacklist. Perhaps the surveillance on Harmony will now be removed, at least to some extent, and the danger to Captain Naughty, when he comes in again, considerably lessened. That this was the case, we shall see in our next chapter. End of chapter 38「Chapter Thirty Nine of the Petticoat Commando by Johanna Brandt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Watchword Oiling the Hinges. Three weeks went uneventfully by. Visitors at Harmony were few and far between, for the story of the raid went quickly through the town, and many people 
who had been in the habit of visiting the Van Warmelos, all unsuspecting of the cloud under which they rested, took alarm at this first open hint of danger, and discreetly withdrew from the scene. When Hansie thought of them, it was with some contempt and bitterness, but her mind was, at the time, occupied with more important matters, and her fair-weather friends soon passed from her life, never to return again. Only about a dozen remained, mostly women, friends, staunch and true, upon whom one could depend through days of the most crushing adversity. How close we came to one another in those days, only those who have been through similar experiences can ever realize. Those three uneventful weeks were by no means the least trying of the long war. Sorely tested nervous systems were giving way. Fine constitutions were being broken down, and powers of resistance had reached their limit. It needed but the acute anxiety and intense strain of the last adventure, which I am about to relate, to reduce our heroines to a state bordering on the hysterical. The phases of the moon were watched in suspense, and when the time drew near for the next visit from the spies, Mrs. Von Warmelow took the precaution of locking Carlo up in the kitchen before retiring for the night, although she let him out very early every morning in order not to arouse the suspicions of the servants. Gentleman Jim, ever on the alert, soon found out that something unusual was taking place. "'Why you lock up the dog every night, Missy?' he inquired one morning. Mrs. Von Warmelow was completely taken by surprise, but answered with great presence of mind. "'Oh, because he barks so much that we cannot sleep. But I think I will have to let him out again, because thieves will help themselves to the fruit if there is no watchdog about.' The ruse had been found out, and Carlo had to be released, although his vigilance added greatly to the dangers of the situation. The grapes were ripe. Great, luxurious bunches of purple and golden fruit were weighing down the sturdy old vines. "'I wish Captain Naughty would come,' Hansie sighed. "'Harmony is at its very best.' "'He won't come again. I am convinced of that,' her mother answered mournfully. "'No more news from the field for us. The dangers are too great, and nothing could be gained by coming into town now that our friends have nearly all been sent away. We shall see, Hansie said cheerfully. I have a strong presentiment that the men are coming in this very night. I am going to put everything in readiness for them. We must go to bed early, dear mother. Perhaps we shall have very little rest tonight. This was Sunday night, February 9th. Hansie packed away various little articles lying about the bedrooms and bathroom, and generally prepared herself for the midnight adventure which she felt more than ever convinced would take place within a few hours, while Mrs. Van Warmelo went about with a feather and an oil can, oiling the hinges and locks. She was soon sound asleep in her mother's bedroom, for the two women were not as brave as they had been during the first part of the war, and had got into the habit of sleeping together for company. Suddenly, at about 2 a.m., they both started up violently at the sound of Carlo's furious barking near their window, where he usually kept guard. Mrs. Von Warmelow sat up and panted, Here they are. But Hansie's heart was beating so loudly in her throat that she was unable to reply. Mrs. Von Warmelow went quickly to the window, and, on cautiously raising the blind, saw the forms of two men close to the window, undistinguishable in the darkness, but quite evidently the cause of Carlos's startled and furious barking. She ran through the bathroom, and, opening the door leading to the garden, asked softly, "'Who is there?' "'Applecoose,' the welcome answer came clearly and cautiously, and Mrs. Von Warmelow drew the men unceremoniously into the room, noiselessly locking the door. "'Not a word, not a sound,' she commanded. "'Remove your boots. You have never been in greater peril.' "'Hush, what was that? A man's voice outside. The sergeant major? The police? My God, then we are lost indeed.' 
But no, only one moment of agonizing suspense and the familiar voice of Gentleman Jim could be heard reprimanding the growling watchdog. What for you make so much noise, Carlo? Go to sleep, bad dog. You frighten everybody when you kick up so much row. Muttering discontentedly, he retired to his room, evidently reassured by the dead silence which pervaded the house. For some time, the four people inside stood close together without a word. No lights were lit. No sound whatever was made until Carlos's restless growling ceased and he settled himself to sleep again. There were only a few whispered words of welcome and greeting exchanged, and a breathless account given of the dangers with which Harmony was surrounded. "'How did you come in?' Mrs. Van Warmelo asked. "'Through the drift,' Naughty replied. "'There were no guards. In fact, we did not see a soul from first to last, and the dog was the only one to object to our midnight wanderings. We were nearly on top of him before he woke.' "'Nearly on top of the sensitive and alert watchdog before he became aware of their proximity? No wonder, then, that the Boer spies frequently glided up so close to the English outpost that they were able to knock them down with wooden sticks or the butt-end of a gun before they could give the alarm or utter a sound. The men were tired and exhausted, and gladly stretched themselves on the beds to get what sleep they could before morning, having first divested themselves of their outward trappings, helmets, etc., which they buried under the floor. As before, the captain came in khaki uniform, while his orderly, Ventner, was dressed like a soldier. As it was necessary for them to remain in Mrs. Van Warmelo's bedroom in order to be near the place of refuge under the floor, mother and daughter retired to the dining room, there to watch and wait for the dawn of day. Would that long night never end? Every time Carlo barked, the two women started up from their couches and listened with straining ears for sounds of commotion outside, but in vain. Nothing disturbed the serenity of the night, and when the rosy glow of dawn broke in the eastern sky and gradually spread its glory over the hushed and expectant earth, Hansie fell into a fitful slumber. Not so her mother. Mrs. Von Warmelow had been quietly pondering over Gentleman Jim's unexpected appearance at the first sign of commotion in the night, and had come to the conclusion that something should be done to disarm his suspicions. That the guard of the military police had been withdrawn from Harmony was very evident, but it was quite possible that the task of maintaining a vigilant watch had been transferred to Jim, with promise of a liberal payment if he succeeded in getting information which might lead to the arrest of Boer spies. Mrs. Van Warmelo, therefore, cautiously rose while the rest of the household lay in sleep, plucked clusters of grapes from the vine, and strewed them about the garden paths. The ruse answered excellently. Gentleman Jim himself discovered the grapes lying about the garden and was loud in his expressions of indignation. "'Them thieves have been at the grapes again,' he called out. "'Look here, Missy, here is a bunch, and another, and here is some more.' He shook his head in despair. The sergeant major, too, was sent for and informed of the plundering that had been carried on in the small hours of the morning. "'What is to be done?' he asked. "'Shall I put a guard here again?' Mrs. Von Warmelow thanked him for his kind offer, but thought that very little damage had been done, and was of the opinion that Carlos's vigilance would be sufficient to prevent the thieves, whoever they might be, from returning on a second pilfering expedition. When Hansie woke, it was past six o'clock, and the captain was sitting near her, drinking coffee and chatting with her mother in a matter-of-fact way, evidently quite at home and glad to find himself in such comfortable quarters again. The whole of that eventful February 10th was spent in writing dispatches and procuring articles of clothing and small necessaries for the men to take out with them. Three pairs of riding breeches, shirts, brown felt hats, leggings, boots, soap, salt, cotton, etc., etc. Fortunately, 
among the few remaining men in town who could be trusted to carry on these commissions was the young man behind the counter in the store in Church Street. To him Hansie went with a small list, which she laid before him without a word. He glanced over it and whistled softly. Leggings, riding breeches. When must you have them? If possible, this evening, she replied. I'll do my best, he said, and she departed joyfully. Now, I never could have got those things myself without rousing great suspicion, she thought, as she cycled rapidly to the next person whom she had been instructed to see, van der Westhuizen, with the bandaged arm. The captain came in last night with Venter, she whispered hurriedly. They are at Harmony, and Naughty wishes to see you as soon as possible on a matter of great importance. No one must know of his presence in town this time, not even our best friends, for he has a dangerous mission to fulfill, and you must help him. I shall be there some time today, he said. Hansie thanked him and departed. Much writing work waited her at Harmony, and the rest of the day was spent in drawing up dispatches at the captain's dictation and making notes of the condition of the various commandos. In the course of a long conversation with him, he told her the object of his visit and why he required van der Westhuizen's service. My flying column of scouts is over sixty strong, picked men, and wonderfully brave, he said. They are all in khaki and scour the country, doing the enemy incalculable harm. But they would be of more service to the commandos if they had better horses. Our horses are worn out and underfed. Their life is very hard, and it is imperative that we should have them reinforced. Now we have heard that there are many magnificent horses kept at Skinner's Court, remounts kept in good condition for special use of officers. Those horses we must have, and we have come to get all the information we can about the strength of the guards at Skinner's Court. For this I require van der Westhuizen's assistance. Hansie felt a thrill of excitement. The adventure was very much to her taste, and she remembered with delight that first successful raid on British stables. She wished she could supply the desired information. To steal the enemy's best horses seemed to her an enterprise worth toiling for, for there would probably be little or no bloodshed connected with it, and if successful, the reward would be very great. But she felt assured that the adventure could not be in more capable, more trustworthy hands than in those of the silent van der Westhuizen. When van der Westhuizen arrived, he and the captain were closeted together in the bedroom for nearly an hour, and then he departed as silently as he had come. But Hansie had observed the look of steadfast determination on his face and was satisfied. Very unlike the previous visit was this, the last sojourn of the Secret Service men at Harmony. There was no entertaining of shoals of trusted friends, no lying about under the trees, no sociable gathering of strawberries. The men were not allowed to leave their bedroom during the day, but remained in safe proximity to the place of refuge under the floor, where their belongings lay buried. Of the many plans devised by Mrs. Von Warmelow for the safety of her guests, the following was decided upon as being the most ingenious. A large bath was brought into her bedroom and half filled with soapy water. Bath towels, sponges, and other toilet requisites being placed nearby in readiness for use. In the event of a raid, Mrs. Von Warmelow, if she had time to do so, would rush into the room, locking the door on the inside, while her daughter, if she had the presence of mind and kept cool enough, informed the police that her mother was having a bath. Thus time would be gained to enable the men to creep into their hiding place. The bath of soapy water, standing in readiness night and day, was a constant source of amusement during that time of suspense. The men begged to be allowed to smoke, but Mrs. Van Warmelo protested strongly. In case of an unexpected search, how was she going to account for the smell of smoke in her bedroom? 
Seeing, however, that this restriction was becoming a source of great discomfort to them in the monotony of their imprisonment, she gave them permission to smoke in the dining room, while she and Hansy kept watch outside. Even with these precautions, Mrs. Van Warmelo seemed to feel very uneasy, and Hansy, coming into the kitchen unexpectedly one afternoon, found the captain standing beside the stove and blowing vigorous puffs of smoke up the chimney. Volcanoes and earthquakes would have been a welcome change to every one after those never-to-be-forgotten days of strain and tension, and much as Hansy had longed to see someone from commando again, her longing to see these men depart became a hundred times more intense. There was no pleasure for any one during the visit of two days, for the very air was charged with treachery, and not even the servants could be trusted with the dread secret. The men were waited on stealthily, food was brought in unobserved, and the plates and dishes washed surreptitiously by the two watchful women, who took turns in guarding the place and enjoyed what conversation they could get in fragments from their guests. That night was spent in anxiety and unrest, and again the glorious day was hailed with joy and relief. Van der Westhuizen was an early visitor that morning, and the report of his investigations of the past night must have been highly satisfactory to the men, to judge by their faces. The women were not taken into their confidence, but Hansie watched and wondered, and dared not even ask whether the attack on Skinner's court was to be made or not. It was better not to know. The long summer's day went slowly by, broken only once, when Hansie rushed into the bedroom with a breathless, "'Danger! Danger! Hide yourselves!' It was not at all funny at the time, but afterwards, when Hansie thought it over, she laughed and laughed again at the recollection of those two men diving for the hole in the floor, and of their resentful looks when they emerged, on hearing that the alarm had been caused by the unexpected appearance of Um Ah. The departure that night was in dead silence. There was no hearty send-off under the six willows, no escort through the bush. Van der Westhuizen, alone, going on ahead to see if the coasts were clear. The events of that night are blurred and vague in the memory of the two solitary women, and Hansie's diary contains but meager information on the subject. In fact, her war diary practically ends here. Frail womanhood had reached the breaking point. A period of dull suffering, of deadly indifference, followed, broken one day by the news with which the whole town rang, that Skinner's court had been stormed by the Boers, and that every horse had been taken, fourteen in all, valuable remounts of the officers. Hansie just glanced at her mother, and then asked hoarsely, "'Was anyone hurt? Was anyone taken?' "'No,' the answer came, with a curious look at her strained face. The attack was so wholly unexpected, and the Boers so evidently informed of every detail of the place, that they were gone with all the horses almost before a shot could be fired. This meant not only that the captain had reached his men in safety, but that the enterprising object of his visit had been successfully carried out, beyond his most sanguine expectations. And now we take our leave of the brave captain, whose name appears so often and so honorably in this book, and in leaving him we quote, at his request, the tribute with which he closed his little book, In Dudes Gavar, In Danger of Death, published in August 1903, a tribute to the women who assisted him. I feel it my duty, before closing the story of our personal experiences of the war, to direct a word of thanks and appreciation to those faithful South African mothers and sisters who personally supported us during those difficult days and did what they could in Pretoria to further our cause in the field. But how can this be done? I have no adequate words at my command, and I feel that the work of these women is above all expression of appreciation. When I look back on those days, there floats across my mind not only the names but also the personalities of each of these worthy women, and I remember, too, the minutest detail 
their self-sacrifice and zeal, with which they stood by us during our visits to Pretoria, while exposed to the dangers of themselves being plunged into the greatest difficulties. But for this they had no thought, no care, as long as the sacred cause could be advanced. I feel, however, that it would be out of place to mention the names of a few, where so many risked their all, willingly offering even the sacrifice of their lives, if necessary, to further the interest of our cause. How fervently I should have wished to see their great work crowned with a well-deserved reward. He who rules the destinies of nations decreed it otherwise, however, and we must bow in resignation to his will. But faithful women and girls of South Africa, rest assured that your noble work and self-sacrifice have not been in vain. For myself, I find in that which was performed by you this great abiding comfort that so long as South Africa possesses women and girls of your stamp, so long can we go forward to meet the future hopefully and cheerfully, so long has the spirit, nourished by you, still lives and thrives in our midst, so long may we pursue our way fearlessly. The struggle is over, brought to an end more than a year ago, and some of us have already learned to adopt ourselves to our altered circumstances. We have been taught by those whose position as leaders of the people gives them the fullest right thereto how to conduct ourselves, and we require no further encouragement to follow that advice. But we feel that we cannot lay sufficient emphasis on the injunction to be true to one another as a nation, to be true to our traditions of the past, true to the lessons we have learnt in the recent conflict. We have seen to what a pass one can be brought by infidelity. Let us in future live in such a way that nothing may be lost of the honor which is our inheritance from the battlefields of South Africa. Farewell. End of chapter 39、Peace, peace, no、If I may dare to hope that there are among my readers who have followed me with so much patience through this book, some sufficiently interested in the heroine to desire information of what befell her in her future lot, I should wish to give to them just a glimpse or two into scenes as totally different from the events recorded in this volume as night is from day. And to do this freely, unreservedly, I must endeavor to forget my close connection with the heroine, a connection the thought of which has hampered and restricted me from first to last in choosing and rewriting the material from her diary. Her diary, as I have said before, had ended soon after her last adventure with the spies, never to be resumed again. I do not, however, write from memory in this brief chapter on her subsequent experiences, for I have before me for reference a pile of letters from her to her mother. Almost her last word when she left her native land was an injunction to her mother to preserve her letters for the future. For when I am married, mother dear, you will be my diary. Hansie's health gave way. Not in a week or a month, not in any way perceptible to those around her, but stealthily, treacherously, and relentlessly, the fine constitution was undermined. The highly strung nervous system was shattered. This had taken place chiefly during the desolate and dark hours of the night, when helpless in the grip of the fiend insomnia, the wretched girl abandoned herself to hopelessness and despair. And the time was soon to come when she feared those dreadful waking hours even less than the brief moments of fitful slumber which overcame her worn out, shattered frame. For no sooner did she lose her consciousness in sleep than she was overpowered by some hideous nightmare and found herself shrieking, drowning in the black waters of some raging torrent, or pursued by some infuriated lunatic or murderer, or enveloped. 
in the deadly coils of some hideous reptile. Shuddering from head to foot, after each of these most awful realities of the night, she was soothed and comforted by the tender hands of her distressed and anxious mother. Something had to be done. Of that there was no doubt. Not even the strongest mind could have endured such a strain for any length of time. And that Hansie's reason was preserved at all, I put down to the fact that she had never once throughout the war entertained the idea, the possibility, of the loss of her country's independence. The blow, when it came, found her so far from the scenes of her recent sufferings, as we shall see presently, that she was able to endure it, as one, far removed from the deathbed of her best beloved, is spared the crushing details, the cruel realities, of that last parting scene. The thought of the strong heart across the seas, waiting to receive her, would have been of more support to her in those days, had she known by experience what it could mean to a woman, tried as she had been, to place herself and all her grief in the protecting, understanding love of a good and noble man. But even this comfort was denied to her. In fact, the thought of her uncertain future and her fear that the step she was about to take might prove to be a great mistake in her abnormal condition were an added burden to our sorely tried and now completely broken down patriot. Plans were made to send her out of the country. Her sister, Miss Cloete, who had for some months been trying to procure a permit to visit the Transvaal, was, after great trouble and inconvenience, successful in her endeavors, and arrived at Harmony on Saturday, March 29th, 1902. What words from my poor pen can describe the emotions of that meeting? Even Hansie's diary has nothing to say except, Let us draw the veil. But memory is strong, and the bands of love and kinship are unbreakable, even under the adversities of long and bitter years. Nay, rather they are strengthened by the threads of common woe, woven into their very fiber at such a time of bitter trial. The mother spent hours with her elder daughter, happy beyond power to express, relating her experiences and adventures, comparing notes, and making plans for their future. All that month of April was filled with rumors of an early peace, and hopes were buoyed up with the certainty that peace with honor would and could be the only termination to the peace conferences. Incredible as it may seem to some of my readers, the Boer opinion was that England was about to end hostilities, and that, under certain terms, the independence of the two republics would be assured. No reliable information reached our friends at Harmony, for the activities of the Secret Service had ceased entirely, at least as far as the town was concerned. Uncertainty, excitement, expectation filled the air, reaching their height on April 12th, when the news of the Boer leader's arrival at the capital spread like wildfire through the town. Stein, Botha, De Wet, De La Rey, Ritz, and a host of others were amongst their own again, under circumstances of unique importance. They were not allowed to mix freely with the crowd, but kept in a state of highly honored captivity in the beautiful double-storied house known as Parkzeit, opposite Burger Park well guarded night and day by armed patrols who kept the crowd at bay with a friendly move on please when they touched the limit of their beat mrs van warmelo and her two daughters like so many other citizenses lost no opportunity of walking in the neighborhood of parkzicht and they were fortunate beyond their wildest hopes in being greeted by the generals on more than one occasion one day as they were passing they observed the familiar figure of General Botha on the balcony. They waved their handkerchiefs, and there was no doubt about his recognition, for he took off his hat and waved it, kissing both his hands to them. General Botha it was, who, after the war, said to Mrs. von Warmelow, clasping her hand and looking earnestly into her eyes, "'You have done and risked what even I would not have dared.' After six or seven days in Pretoria, 
the Boer leaders left for their commandos to deliberate, with what result Hansie did not know until two months later in mid-ocean, where at a distant isle the news of the declaration of peace was made known to her. The three women at Harmony now turned their thoughts into another channel. The mother, being far from well herself, arrangements had to be made to leave her in the companionship of some suitable and congenial woman until her boys came home, one from the front, if he were still alive, the other from captivity. A girlfriend offered to take Hansie's place at Harmony and promised not to leave Mrs. Von Wormelow until the country was in a settled state again. This was Hansie's only crumb of consolation during those last days at home. Many difficulties were made about her permits when she applied for leave to go to Holland, and many were the questions asked, her interview with General Maxwell being the least unsatisfactory when she told him of her approaching marriage. "'You may go with pleasure,' he said, but a few days afterwards Hansie received a letter from the provost marshal saying that the present regulations do not allow burghers or their families to leave South Africa. Hansie wrote to Lord Kitchener, but received no reply, and it was nearly the middle of May, after some weeks of uncertainty, harder far the bear than trouble of a more decided character, when she and Mrs. Cloete left the capital for Cape Colony. Hansie's last words in her diary are, There is quite a history connected with the procuring of my permits, which I shall relate another time. I am too tired now. Words significant of what the girl had endured in parting from her mother and leaving her beloved country at a time so critical. On an ocean steamer she found herself at last, alone, for in that crowd there was no face familiar to her to be seen. She mixed freely with the crowd. She sought in the games with which these voyages are usually passed, to forget, to forget. But the nights of sleeplessness remained, her waking terror, with which she was consumed. Two men there were who proved sympathetic, one a Scotchman, the other an Englishman, both anti-Boer, and sadly misinformed when first she met them, both converts by the time they reached their native shores. Sitting at table, she listened intently to the conversations on the war, the war, the never-ending war. On no occasion did she breathe a word of what she knew, of what she felt, until one day at dinner a young English lieutenant, covered with glory, and returning home a hero of the war, enlarged on the services rendered by one brave officer, well known by name to Hansi. It is not only what he achieved with so much success in the field, he continued. I am thinking now of those two years he spent in the Pretoria forts before the war, a common laborer, doing menial work with other men, and secretly making plans and drawing charts of the Pretoria fortifications. Every detail was made known to our military before we went to war. Exclamations of surprise, a murmur of admiration, ran along the table. Hansie waited until there was a lull, and then she asked, The work carried out by him, was it done under oath of allegiance to the Transvaal government? There was one moment's painful silence before the young lieutenant answered with a laugh. Of course, it could not possibly have been done otherwise, but all is fair in love and war. War? Hansie exclaimed. I thought you said that this was done some years before the war. Yes, but we all knew what things were leading to. This incident was the first hint among the passengers that she was not one of them. At first they looked at her askance, but as the days went on and the girl steadfastly avoided every allusion to the war, refusing to express her opinions to anyone, except the two men mentioned above, the feeling of discomfort passed, and she was once again included in the pastimes of the ship's company. As they were nearing Tenerife, the longing for news, for the latest cable from England and South Africa, possessed every soul on board, and now I find that search as I will, within the recesses of my mind, for words 
with which to describe adequately such scenes, brain and hand, are powerless. There was peace in South Africa, peace with honor for England, peace and defeat for the Boers. In a moment, the ship's crew went mad, and the wild cheering rolled over the waves. Hansie stood stupefied, and strange it is that at a time like this an insignificant detail should stand out in sharp relief against the background of her dulled sensibilities. An hysterical woman ran up to her with outstretched hands, crying, "'Oh, my dear, my dear, let me congratulate you. Let us shake hands.' The girl, thus taken by surprise in all that crowd, recoiled in shuddering distress, while, with hands clasped convulsively behind, she murmured, "'Oh, I could not, I could not.' A wave of deep resentment passed over the ship's passengers, and hostile eyes looked on her frowningly. That night, as the good ship was plowing the waters on her way once more, a solitary figure stood on the deserted decks. In the salons, great bumpers of champagne were passing round, while the strains of God Save the King and Rule Britannia floated over the ocean waves. A man in search of her fearing perhaps, I know not what, approached the drooping figure of the girl and pressed her hand in silent sympathy. There is no peace, she said. Do you think I believe these lying cables? The Boers will never yield. If you knew what I know, you would take these reports for what they are worth. I have been trying to think what it all can mean, and this is the conclusion I have come to. If it be true that peace has been proclaimed, then the Boers have preserved their independence, and this last fact has been excluded from the cables in view of the approaching coronation. But my own conviction is that there is no peace at all, but that these cables have been sent to reassure the English public and to make it possible to celebrate the crowning of the king in a splendor unclouded by the horrors of the South African War. Believe me, when the coronation is over, you will hear of a mysterious renewal of hostilities. The man was silent, troubled. He had not the heart to argue with the girl. Perhaps he thought, and rightly thought, that this strange illusion of the brain, this confident belief in her own convictions, would help to tide her over the first days to follow. I cannot understand, he said, how Mrs could have asked you to shake hands with her. Oh, I was wrong, Hansie said. She meant it kindly. How could she understand? I will apologize tomorrow. It had been arranged that Hansie should spend a few days in London to see some friends before proceeding to Holland. She found the mighty metropolis in the throes of preparation for an event of unparalleled magnificence. Every sign of splendor and rejoicing was a fresh sword through the heart of our sorely tried young patriot. The people with whom she stayed, old Pretoria friends, had not an inkling of what was passing in her mind. Their warm and loving greetings, their loud expressions of delight that the war had come to an end at last, were so many pangs added to her grief. "'You will come with us to the coronation,' her hostess said. "'We have splendid reserved seats, and this event will be unparalleled in the history of England. Again, the unfortunate girl found herself recoiling. Taken by surprise, again she said, Oh, I could not, not to save my life. Not go see the coronation? I am surprised at you. Very few South African girls are lucky enough to benefit by such an opportunity. I must say, I think it very narrow-minded of you. You disappoint me. The war is over now, and while we are all trying to promote a feeling of good fellowship, you nourish such an unworthy and narrow-minded spirit. Narrow-minded? Unworthy? The iron entered deep into her soul, and when she looks back now and takes a brief survey of what she suffered throughout those years, that moment stands out as one into which all the fears, the hopes, the agonies of one short lifetime had been crowded. Sometimes the human heart, when tried beyond endurance, will reach a point where but a trifling incident, an unkind word, is needed to break down life's stronghold. 
This point our heroine had reached. Something passed out of her soul, an undefinable something of which the zest for life is made, and as she felt the black waters of despair closing over her, she almost gasped for breath. She turned away. You will never understand. I think it is very kind of you to make such plans for my enjoyment, but to the coronation of the English king I will not go. Leave me here. I have some writing to do. No need to be distressed on my account. My one regret is that my presence here at such a time should be a source of so much painfulness to us both. With cold courtesy, the subject of the approaching coronation was dropped until the next day when the appalling, the stupefying news of the postponement of the coronation spread through the hushed streets of the great metropolis. The king was dying, was perhaps already dead. The king had undergone a critical operation and his life still hung in the balance. The king could not be crowned. Already the black wings of death seemed to be stretched over the mighty city, with its millions and millions of inhabitants. The multitude was waiting in hushed expectancy, in breathless suspense. Hansi, walking through the streets with one of the men whose sympathy on board had been of such unspeakable comfort to her, never felt more unreal in her life. Her mind was in a maze. She groped about for words with which to clothe her thoughts, but groped in vain, for even the power of thought had been suspended for a time. Her companion, glancing at her face, asked suddenly, curiously, "'Would you be glad if King Edward were to die?' There was a long pause, while the girl strove to analyze her feelings. At last she answered, slowly, simply, truthfully, "'No, I would be sorry.' And in these words, good reader, when I think of them, I find a certain solution to the problem of her behavior on many occasions when brought into close contact with her country's enemies. There was never anything personal in the most bitter feelings of resentment and hatred of her country's foes, and never at any time did she belong to the ranks of those among her fellow patriots who deemed it an unpardonable crime to recognize and appreciate the good qualities possessed by them. A love of fair play characterized her even as a child, and it is certain that the cruel circumstances of the war developed this sense of justice to an abnormal extent, often bringing upon her in later years misunderstanding and distrust from those who should have been her friends. It is June 28th, a glorious, cloudless summer's morn. Speeding swiftly, almost silently, cutting its way through the calm, blue waters of the English Channel, a passenger boat is fast approaching Holland's shores. The hour is early, and of the few figures moving on the pier, one stands apart, watching intently, as the ship draws near. He waves his hat. He has recognized the figure of the girl who stands on deck, and waves her handkerchief in response to his greeting. His strong hands clasp hers, and now the discreet reader need not advert his eyes. No need here to draw the veil, for Hansie had written from London to this tall, broad-shouldered man, What is left of me is coming to you now, but we must meet as friendly acquaintances until we are both certain of ourselves. How long this friendly acquaintance lasted, it is difficult to say, for there is a difference of opinion on the point. She says, not less than sixty minutes. He asserts not more than thirty-five. The exquisite serenity of her father's native land, especially on such a perfect day in midsummer, had never seemed to her so sweet. Here, indeed, she felt that peace could come to her at last. But not yet, not yet. Strong emotions of a different kind awaited her. The meeting of beloved friends and relatives, after seeming endless years of pain, proving no less trying than the introduction to a large circle of future relatives and friends. Hansi had to be lionized as heroine of the war, and this was done in a wholehearted, generous way, 
which was a constant source of wonder to her. She was carried on the hands, as the Dutch saying goes, by all who had the remotest claim on her. Functions were arranged for her, receptions held, to which white-haired women and stately, venerable men came from afar to shake her hand, because she was a daughter of the Transvaal, nothing more, not because of what she had done and endured, for this was known only to one or two. Old friends from South Africa there were in scores, and for the time the state of Holland was transformed into a colony of Boers, which seemed complete when the Boer leaders, Botha, De Wet, and De La Rey, arrived with their staffs. Then it seemed as if the people of Holland lost their heads entirely, and scenes such as those which took place daily in the streets are never to be forgotten by those who witnessed them. All this, though wonderful, was not the best thing for our heroine, who was living on her nerves, though in a different way, as surely as she did during those cruel years of war. Added to this, she was frequently tried beyond endurance by the questions, Why did the Boers give in? How could the Boers give in and lose their independence? One conversation in particular was burnt into her brain. Was it the concentration camps? No, the answer came slowly. No, it was not the concentration camps. The high mortality was past. The weakest had been taken, and there was no cause for anxiety for those remaining in the camps. Their rations had been increased and improved. There was no more of that first awful suffering. What was it, then, the arming of the natives? The answer came more slowly. No, it was not the arming of the natives. Their forces were more scattered, for they were chiefly employed in guarding the railway lines, in protecting stock and guarding blockhouses. Though their addition to the British ranks undoubtedly weakened our strength to some extent, their inborn respect for the Boer would have prevented them from ever rendering valuable service to the English. How we laughed, my sister and I, when on the railway journey from Pretoria to Cape Town we saw the line patrolled by hundreds of these natives, with gun in hand, stark naked, except for a loincloth and a bandolier. So much waste of ammunition. No, the arming of the natives would have been the last thing to induce the Boers to surrender. Then it seems to me incomprehensible. Surely death was preferable to defeat. Yes, a thousand times. But you forgot the National Scouts, the Judas Boers. They broke our strength, not by their skill in the use of arms, not by their knowledge of our country and our methods, no. They broke our strength by breaking our ideals, by crushing our enthusiasm, by robbing us of our inspiration, our faith, our hope. With averted eyes and seemingly groping for one last ray of light, the man continued, But where were your heroes, your heroes of Magerfontein, Spienkop, and Colenso? Where were our heroes, the girl echoed bitterly, in their graves, in our hospitals, in captivity. Ever foremost in the field, one by one they fell. But the remnant that is escaped of the house of Israel shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. Although under the shadow of this great national calamity we cannot see it now, there is hope for our sad South Africa. It is too soon to speak of a united race, but the time will surely come when, in the intermarriage of our children and our children's children, will be formed a nation great and strong and purified. Through all those weeks our heroine never slept. It seemed incredible that the frail form of a girl should be endowed with so great a power of endurance, and that the human mind can stand the strain of smiling self-control by day, abandonment of grief by night. Those nearest to her, divining something of what she was passing through, lavished countless proofs of tender sympathy on her. Innumerable acts of loving care for her personal comfort and well-thought-out plans for drawing her away from herself into the charmed circle of the B. Labochere house. And when her marriage day drew near, she turned away with a superficial glance at the array of costly presents, 
to devour once again the cables from South Africa, the telegrams from her generals, the letter and photograph of her beloved president, inscribed in his illegible hand, for services rendered during the late war. Last but not least, there came to her official-looking documents from Het Lu, the personal congratulations of the Queen, the Prince Consort, and the Queen Mother, and the ancient blood of Holland coursed more swiftly through her veins as she thought of Wilhelmina, the dauntless young Queen of the Netherlands, now her Queen. In all the ranks of the Petticoat Commando, there was not one woman who had dared more, risked more, than the brave Queen of Holland when she dispatched her good man of war to bear away from the shores of Africa the hunted president of the South African Republic to the refuge of her hospitable land. Flowers, flowers everywhere, first in baskets, then in cartloads, then in wagon loads. They were deposited at the doors until they overflowed from the reception rooms into the halls and staircases and even the verandas. Chrysanthemums and roses in riotous profusion, nestling violets, rarest orchids, bright carnations, heavy with the richest perfume. Each flower had a separate message for the bride. They understood, and they enveloped her with their unspoken sympathy. Some there were adorned with her beloved, her most tragic vircolor, and over them she lingered long, breathing a prayer to merciful heaven to still her beating heart forever. Not in the wild beauty of the Swiss scenery did she find rest, not by the calm lakes of sapphire blue, in which she saw reflected the rugged mountains, soul-satisfying in their majestic grandeur, not in the soundless, the mysterious regions of the eternal snows, but in the north of Holland, where she found herself when autumn fell, Hansi slept. Languid and more languid she became, drooping visibly. She sank into oblivion in that northern village home conscious only in her waking hours of the cold, the driving sleet, the howling wind, the ceaseless drip-drip of the swaying trees. As the long winter months crept by, her sleep became more and more profound, less haunted by the hideous nightmares of the past. And though she at first rebelled, ashamed of her growing weakness, she was soon forced to yield to the resistless demands of outraged nature. In this, she was supported by her husband, who, unknown to her, was acting on the advice of the famous nerve specialist, who had watched her unobserved. Let her sleep, if need be for a year, and in the end, you will find her normal and restored. Of that I am convinced, he had said, and in these words her husband found his greatest comfort, as he tucked his little dormouse in and tiptoed from the darkened room. Hansie lost count of time, but there were two days in the week of which she was quite sure, the day on which the South African mail reached her and the day on which it was dispatched. In between she slept, as we have seen, but when she awoke she always knew that her enfranchised spirit had been to her native land. A full year had gone by, fifteen months, and when the first breath of winter once more touched the land, she gradually became aware of voices calling to her, insistent, imperative voices from across the seas. "'I must go,' she said. "'What am I doing here? South Africa is calling. My people want me there. You and I must go. There is great work for both of us.' And he, no less ardent and enthusiastic, yielded to her prayers, bade farewell to home and fatherland, sailed away with her to the unknown. In all the world, she said, there is no pain to be compared with the pain of being born a patriot, but a patriot in exile. May heaven protect me from the tragedy of such a fate. End of chapter 40「Conclusion of the Petticoat Commando » by Johanna Brandt This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
The veil is lifted for one last brief glimpse. Ten years have gone by since the declaration of peace. Ten years, each more wonderful than the last, full to overflowing of life's rich experience of joy and grief. By some strange turn in the hand of destiny, our heroine finds herself, after many vicissitudes, an inhabitant of the Golden City, that Golden City which had wrecked her youth and very nearly wrecked her life. For years it has seemed incredible to her that she should have been destined for the position she now holds, a position of so much trust, so difficult, so critical. A plaything in the hand of fate, she thought at first, when looking from her balcony she saw the Golden City, with its extensive suburbs stretched out at her feet, and heard the distant, never-ceasing roar of the innumerable mine batteries of the Rand. But the resistless hand of fate was drawing her into the sphere of work for which she longed most ardently. Woman's work, at home, abroad, and the glamour of Johannesburg stole over her in time. The terms of peace have been fulfilled. Responsible government for the Transvaal and Free State. And Hansie thinks, with intolerable pain, of that day at Tenerife. Had she but known, had she but known, but the cables she had called them lying cables then, and she was not far wrong, had spoken only of a glorious victory for the English, an unconditional surrender on the part of the Boers. No word about the terms, the only terms on which the Boers would have ever yielded their independence. Responsible government had been followed by the union of the South African provinces. South Africa is united in name, if not yet in reality. But the time will surely come, as we have said before, when, under the softening influence of time, a great united race will be born. Closely pressing around Hansi, as she writes, are eager little faces, reverent little fingers, touching the scattered pages before her, brave eyes of blue and brown, looking wonderingly into hers. Writing a book, mother? about the spies and the lemon juice? Oh, mother, what will the English say? And the accents falling on her ear are in the expressive sweetness of the South African Dutch in its most cultured form. Hansie ought to be a happy woman. None of the joys of life have been withheld from her. And yet, and yet... End of Conclusion Recording by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas. End of the Petticoat Commando by Johanna Brandt.